Mr. Beer, can I explain that um, uh, one of our assessors is uh, <coughs> joined in remotely this morning, and I understand that before we begin hearing evidence, you wish to raise the issue of disclosure. Yes. Um, it's a matter of importance that I wanted to update you and uh, the core participants on before we call Mr Bates to give his oral evidence and commence the substance of the hearings in phases um, five and six. The core participants were sent an email by the solicitor to the inquiry yesterday that contained relevant correspondence from the post office. Uh, that um, dates between the 28th of March and the 5th of April sent to the inquiry. That consists of nine letters. Uh, I would propose to give you a brief background before moving to the current issue. I'm going to try and keep it as succinct as possible, but I also think that putting the issue, the current issue in context may assist you. So you'll recall that the post office's late and problematic disclosure of documents has been a constant theme in this inquiry, resulting in you ordering that we hear oral evidence from the post office and its inquiry representatives in two disclosure-related hearings held in July and September last year. On the 12th of January this year, the inquiry held a further hearing on disclosure and called post office's recognized legal representative, Mr. Jackson, of Burgess Salmon LLP to give oral evidence. You will recall that by and large, the key issue that was discussed at that hearing was how the post office had discovered a further post office repository or data source known as Microsoft Exchange 365. You'll recall that the Microsoft Exchange 365 um, uh, repository was brought to the inquiry's attention during the phase four hearings, and as a result, the inquiry received numerous, sometimes voluminous, last-minute disclosure of documents said to relate to phase four witnesses, on some occasions only days before some witnesses were due to give their evidence. But during the January hearing, Mr Jackson, Jackson said that such last-minute disclosure by the post office during the phase four hearings had been, quote, suboptimal. Uh, those late disclosures had put immense pressure on the inquiry council and solicitor teams who worked extremely hard to ensure that the phase four hearings could in fact continue as planned. In some instances, regrettably, a decision was made to postpone or reschedule a witness at short notice, including, you'll remember, Mr Jenkins and Mr Longman, both of whom the inquiry has now scheduled to hear during phases five and six. Whilst other matters were discussed at the hearing held on the, 9th, uh, on the 12th of January, the focus was on the post office's work related to the Microsoft Exchange repository. On the 31st of January this year, and following the hearing, you made directions which were published on the inquiry website. Those directions provided that, firstly, a meeting would be held between the representatives of the inquiry and the post office to discuss disclosure issues as soon as reasonably practicable and in any event, well before the commencement of oral hearings in phases five and six, you directed that the meeting would be minuted and that the minutes should be agreed and thereafter disclosed to core participants. And secondly, you ordered that a further disclosure hearing should be uh, convened either before or during uh, phases five and six of the inquiry. On the 28th of February 2024, members of the inquiry team um, and information management team uh, met with the post office and its re uh, representatives um, in this building as directed by you and the inquiry later circulated a copy of the minute of that meeting as agreed with the post office to call participants. I'll not read the minute in full but I note that paragraph three of the minute as circulated says as follows. At the outset of the meeting leading counsel to the inquiry, that's me, uh, noted that from the inquiry's perspective, the aim of the meeting was to ensure that the post office are doing as much as possible to ensure phases five and six can proceed in accordance with the inquiry timetable. <coughs> Mr. Jackson confirmed that the post office agreed and noticed, uh, noted that the post office's starting point for the meeting 
was prioritising and clarifying what needed to be done in line with your directions, ensuring reasonable and proportionate disclosure whilst minimising and hopefully avoiding disruption to the hearing timetable and the inquiry's proceedings. Council to the inquiry confirmed that the aim was not minimising disruption to the hearings, but eliminating it, given the post office's highly disruptive uh, late disclosure in phase four. Mr Jackson confirmed that the post office also aspired to eliminate disruption wherever it was possible to do so, and that the post office's recent structural work should have mitigated the likelihood that a new disclosure issue would come from left field. In order to achieve that objective, prior to the meeting, the inquiry had provided the post office with a series of deadlines for any further late disclosure of Microsoft Exchange documents in correspondence. In summary, uh, quote, for all oral witnesses, uh, but for those listed within the four weeks of the inquiry timetable, the inquiry directed that any late disclosure must be provided by the post office no later than six weeks before the date on which the witness is due to be called to give evidence. For the witnesses listed in the first four weeks, separate specific deadlines have been set in March 2024. The inquiry and the post office also discuss other, what the inquiry understood to be relatively ad hoc and less significant potential document sources, i.e. other than Microsoft Exchange. This was outlined in the meeting um, at minute at paragraph 10. Quote, Mr Jackson then took the inquiry legal team through the work completed by the post office regarding other potential document sources, including Mimecast, SMS, and instant messaging, and e-media sources, uh, brackets, corporate devices, servers, backup tapes, and file stores. Post office's representatives confirmed that they had sent and were still sending questionnaires regarding data sources to four specific, former, uh, specific former post office employees and board members. Material held by third party advisors and material relating to whistleblowing was also discussed. In short, the inquiry understood that work was still ongoing in relation to some of the additional data sources, but should post office have any material update, and in particular, should any particular data source contain highly relevant material, post office would alert the inquiry as soon as possible. On distributing the minute to core participants, the inquiry noted that as the disclosure process by the post office was continuing and the disclosure of additional documents to the inquiry had only recently started, uh, I uh, had advised you that the inquiry legal team ought to continue to monitor the post office's compliance with the inquiry disclosure requirements and report to you at regular intervals. The reporting ought to include whether the post office continued to meet the deadlines the inquiry had set in order to enable the phase five and six oral hearings to proceed and thereafter continued as scheduled. At that stage, I and the solicitor to the inquiry advised that we considered it premature for the inquiry to hold a further disclosure hearing prior to the commencement of phases five and six today. You considered our advice and confirmed you agreed with it, but in the light of the historic disclosure issues and the disruptive nature of the post office's late disclosure, of Microsoft Exchange material in phase four, you noted that you wanted to keep this, on, this issue under very close consideration. You also noted that you would not hesitate to hold a hearing should it become necessary in due course. Uh, throughout February and March, the post office continued to disclose a large volume of material as a result of its Microsoft Exchange disclosure failings and the remediation exercises put in place to rectify them. The last of these productions was made on the 22nd of March, 2024. Can I turn to the present issue then? On Thursday, the 28th of March, the legal representatives for the post office notified the inquiry that the post office would be providing the inquiry with documents that day and the following week in relation to witnesses giving evidence during the first week of phases five and six of the hearings and in the latter part of April, or documents which uh, uh, might otherwise be, quote, of interest to the inquiry. The volume of documents was said to be in the low hundreds and no more than a thousand, and to, co and to have come from, quote, a last check scoping exercise, particularly in relation to documents from third party advisors. Some such documents were in response to the inquiry's section 21 notice issued as long ago as the 21st of July, 2023, known as section 21.3 
others were not responsive to a notice or a request from the inquiry but were otherwise of interest. As I say, Section 21.3 was sent by the inquiry to the post office back on the 21st of July last year, in which the inquiry mandated that the post office disclose several categories of material relevant to phases five and six of the inquiry, i.e. documents addressing what was defined in the notice as relevant issues. The relevant issues including reviews of Horizon carried out by Ernst & Young, Deloitte, KPMG and Linklaters. The notice expressly stated the documents, um, that the documents be those created by, sent to or received by, that recorded a conversation or meeting involving or otherwise made reference to 19 specific individuals within the post office. The individuals named in the notice included, but were not limited to, Paula Venels, Alice Perkins, Olwyn Lyons, Angela Vanden Bogard, Mark Davis, Tim Parker, and Susan Crichton. At 5.32 on Thursday, the 28th of March, the post office sent a cover letter for a production of 1,071 documents. The cover letter noticed that the post office had, quote, initiated two assurance exercises, the first being a review of specific third-party material, sorry, third-party advisor material, and the second being search and review of email inboxes of personal assistants, PAs, to the Section 21.3 individuals and other email inboxes of potential relevance where considered appropriate for this exercise. The letter further explained that the post office's, quote, Section 21.3 search methodology focused on the relevant individual's data sources third-party advisor files and personal assistant emails have previously been reviewed for other Rule 9s and Section 21s as explained in previous discl interim disclosure statements. However, as part of assurance, post office has now run such searches across specific third-party advisor files as was set out in the letter. So such third-party advisors included those who the inquiry had specifically named in the Section 21 notice including Linklaters, Deloitte, and KPMG. The Post Office explained that within the production of 1,071 documents, 788 of them were said to be relevant to Section 21.3, of which 583 related to witnesses, and 15 documents were said to be, quote, uh, high, um, of high relevance and uh, material. 44 documents were said to be documents of interest being documents that the post office said were not directly responsive to the notice, but were otherwise of relevance to the inquiry's terms of reference of those six related to witnesses. The remaining 239 documents were family members of such documents. The post office noted uh, that a number of the documents could be apparent duplicates of previous documents already produced, but that information to assist in identifying duplicates would be provided separately. So the Easter break then took uh, place between Friday the 29th of March and Monday the 1st of April. At around 10 a.m. on the 2nd of April, the post office's legal representative contacted the inquiry legal team to note that further documents were to be expected. The post office requested a meeting with the inquiry to provide an update and discuss how the post office intended to disclose further documents. At 11.47 on the 2nd of April, the inquiry confirmed it would be grateful if the post office could please provide the inquiry with the information it should have or would be assisted in, have, in having in relation to the late disclosure that was relevant to hearings or witnesses this week. At 6.58 p.m. that day, the post office sent the inquiry a four-page letter seeking, quote, to provide a brief update regarding the post office's further urgent witness-focused review to best assist the inquiry with anticipated timings for further productions. That letter has been provided to call participants, and I'm not going to repeat it. However, it was in this letter, received after hours on Tuesday, that the inquiry was informed that the post office intended to make, quote, a small number of further Burgess Salmon Field Fisher productions in the near future of further documents relevant to phases five and six. Uh, it was said that most will be directly relevant to witnesses scheduled to appear later in April and then in May to July but a limited amount will relate to witnesses scheduled to appear during this week, i.e. starting today. 
The letter said that the post office anticipated that the documents that relate to witnesses appearing uh, this week are likely to be low in number and or likely, uh, not likely to contain many documents that will give rise to potential questions for those witnesses, but will rather, particularly for non-post office or Royal Mail Group witnesses, for the most part be documents that refer to them. Importantly, the letter said that the post office anticipated making yet further productions of material uh, following five further reviews. It confirmed that the reviews were not related to the Microsoft Exchange remediation process, but as noted already, the documents were relevant to phases five and six and to witnesses scheduled to be called as early as this week. Those five reviews were summarised by the post office as follows. First, the third party advisor and personal assistant review. Secondly, the NAS drive and file share review. Thirdly, the supplementary precautionary minecast review arising from the five, phase five and six remediation review. At the hard copy documents review. And finally, the Patrick Bork 2017 minecast data review. The post office did not provide the numbers of documents for witnesses um, uh, commencing this week, although they anticipated providing those numbers shortly. Between the 2nd of April and the 5th of April, the inquiry re received seven further letters about um, one or more of those reviews. Uh, those letters have also been provided to core participants, and I shouldn't repeat them. Within those letters, the post office disclosed a number of additional documents as follows. On the 3rd of April, 196 documents were disclosed said to be from the NAS drive. The post office said they were continuing to collect material from the post office file share that might be relevant to the phase five and six hearings. Uh, however, the inquiry understands such a measure to be out of an abundance of caution. Also on the 3rd of April, 3,188 documents were disclosed, said to be from, quote, uh, further material identified from third party advisor files and material identified as part of a second assurance review involving searches of email inboxes of personal assistance to Section 21.3 individuals and other inboxes of potential relevance where considered appropriate. This was further to the 1,071 documents already disclosed to the inquiry back on the 28th of March. On Friday the 5th of April, so the Friday that's just passed, the Post Office disclosed 189 documents following a review of Post Office's hard copy material 200 documents following an additional precautionary minecast review. A further 374 documents were disclosed, said to be the third tranche of documents, including, quote, further material identified as part of a second assurance review involving searches of email inboxes of personal assistance to Section 21.3 individuals. This was in addition to the 1,071 documents disclosed on the 28th of March and the 3,188 documents disclosed two days further. The post office said that it was now, quote, urgently reviewing data for personal assistance to the Section 213 individuals who are witnesses and are due to give evidence from the 23rd of April onwards. And they anticipated they would provide the documents to the inquiry on or before this Friday, the 12th of April. So taking the five reviews about which the inquiry was um, informed on the 2nd of April in turn, I understand the position to be as follows. The third party advisor and personal assistant review has seen the disclosure of a total of 4,633 documents since the 28th of March alone. The post office has told us that that review is not yet complete. The NAS drive and file share saw the disclosure of 196 documents from the NAS drive last week but the review is ongoing in relation to other witnesses. The supplementary precautionary Mimecast review arising from the phase five, six remediation review saw the disclosure of 200 documents, but that's now sent to be complete. The hard copy documents review saw the disclosure of 189 documents last week. It's unclear if that review is complete or remains ongoing. The Patrick Bork 2017 Mimecast data work appears to be ongoing. We understand the data is being collected and processed urgently. The volume and timing of such disclosure is unknown, but the post office said that they were working to disclose any further documents well in advance of 
at Patrick Bork's hearing on the 7th of May. So we in the inquiry team wish to inform you and the core participants of uh, these developments without delay. They present issues with which the inquiry has become um, extremely and unfortunately familiar uh, with over the past three years. I should also put the uh, developments in a wider context. Since the end of the phase four hearings alone, so that since the closing submissions on the 2nd of February 2024, the post office has disclosed 73,720 documents to the inquiry, of which the inquiry legal team have characterized 67,210 documents as possibly relating to phases five and six of the inquiry. The inquiry has received um, documents from other providers during that time, albeit none as substantial in volume as the post office. And the inquiry's information management team have confirmed that as of late yesterday, at least 78,211 documents, including but not limited to the post office's documents, that likely or potentially relate to phases five and six of the inquiry may fall for disclosure to core participants. The matters that the inquiry is investigating span two decades and a number of uh, detailed issues. In order to proceed with hearings in a meaningful way, the inquiry has needed to prioritise its disclosure to core participants and will continue to do so. It's with this in mind that we in the inquiry team specifically set deadlines for the receipt of the late exchange material likely to be relevant to the phase five and six um, hearings on a witness by witness and week by week basis in order to ensure that the hearings could go ahead as planned. This was communicated to the post office and the inquiry understood that the post office considered that it had completed its phase five, six exchange remediation exercises by the 22nd of March. The obligation of disclosure to the inquiry is of course ongoing. The inquiry had expected and indeed anticipated ongoing disclosure from providers of documents in certain instances. Documents can be found late, hard copies or electronic files or messages may up turn up in unexpected devices. But the issues that the post office's disclosure to this inquiry have presented have been much more than minor ad hoc or additional disclosure. In particular, the post office's assurance review, as it uh, has called it, of personal assistant emails and other inboxes of potential relevance in response to the inquiry's section 21.3 notice of last year is very concerning. As I say, that notice was sent in July of last year. It lists a number of senior key post office uh, individuals. Such individuals would undoubtedly communicate via their personal assistance. The inboxes of what are called uh, inboxes of potential relevance have not been explained by the post office, so we don't know to whom uh, they relate. Even more concerning, the inquiry emphasised that, that the post office ought to apply a common sense approach to senior custodians as far back as a meeting with the post office in April 2023. So you asked for your team closely to monitor the post office's disclosure to the inquiry. We have done so and will continue to do so. Uh, whilst these new developments are, uh, to use a parliamentary word, unwelcome. Your team is not unprepared. We're committed to doing all that we can to ensure that the hearings can go ahead as planned. And subject to your views, that's what we intend to do, to continue with the hearings. The alternative, further delay to allow the post office to get its disclosure house in order, is not one which is acceptable. It of course follows from that approach that there may be a need to recall some witnesses to ask them questions about documents which have not been processed in time for them to be asked questions about such documents in the coming weeks. So that's the, the approach that we um, intend to take and that's all I say at the moment about this latest late post office disclosure. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Beer. Um, 
the substance or a summary of what Mr. Beer has just uh, explained publicly was provided to me uh, late last week, together with Mr. Beer's and his team's advice that despite the problems which have occurred, we should carry on. I've had the weekend to think about that and also whether it would be necessary to invite core participants to provide their views to me about that. And the decision I have reached is as follows. First of all, I don't wish to hear from the core participants and secondly, we're going to carry on. <coughs> now that is um, perhaps a bold thing to do because it does mean that there may be occasions in which witnesses are giving evidence where the documents haven't caught up with the witnesses, so to speak. And that is a highly undesirable state of affairs. But as Mr. Beer has explained, that can be cured, albeit with some cost to the witness, by recalling them if necessary. The alternative is to have a substantial break. And in my opinion, dare I say judgment, even though I'm not a judge anymore, uh, that is not desirable. <coughs> Make no mistake, everyone, I understand fully that <coughs> The problems with disclosure are capable of creating very significant pressures for all the participants in the inquiry. But protracted adjournments so as to ensure that every relevant disclosable document is in the hands of all core participants prior to a witness giving evidence would also cause very damaging stresses to all the participants. And so I have to exercise judgment and um, come to a balanced decision. And as I've said, my view is that at the moment the problems are not such that we need to call a halt. And my um, intention is to continue with the evidence sessions in accordance with our published timetable, so far as is reasonably possible. I stress, as Mr. Beer has stressed, that the monitoring of disclosure, which I promised would continue throughout, will continue throughout. And if I deem it appropriate, I will certainly use one of our days off, a Monday or sometimes a Friday, to hold a disclosure hearing. So there's a threat to you all. <clears throat> I want to publicly acknowledge, and this is the last of the observations which I wish to make, that at least in part, I may be to blame for some of the problems relating to disclosure. There may be some in this room, in fact there are some in this room, <clears throat> And certainly there are some in the inquiry team who consider that the timetables which I set for the hearing of evidence are unrealistically tight. On any view, the volume of material to be disclosed to the inquiry and then by the inquiry to core participants is enormous. I acknowledge that if the hearing phases had been spread out with greater breaks between, between them, as some have advocated, then some of the disclosure pressures would be eased. However, I am acutely conscious that this public inquiry has been in existence for very nearly three years. Although by the standards of some inquiries, that is a comparatively short period of time. I am unshakable in my belief that this inquiry should not last for a day longer than is strictly necessary. And if that means that the pace at which we proceed causes significant work pressures for us all, 
then I'm afraid that's a price we're all going to have to pay. So thank you for your words, Mr. Beer. And I think we're ready for some evidence. Well, just before we do that, can I turn to a brighter note? All right, a brighter note. Thank you. <laughs> um, as you know, sir, and it was publicly announced um, by the inquiry on the 9th of January this year, the inquiry um, uh, jointly appointed Dame Sandra Dawson and Dr. Katie Stewart to the role of governance expert witnesses. Uh, Dame Sandra is Professor Emerita of Management Studies University College, Cambridge, and a fellow, formerly the master of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. She acted as an expert member on organization, governance, and leadership on the expert advisory group on the Windrush Lessons Learned Review, and regularly advises on leadership, governance, and organization structure. Dr. Stewart is a policy governance expert and was a visiting scholar at, at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. Dame Sandra and Dr. Stewart have been instructed to produce two reports addressing issues relating to leadership, management, and governance. The first of those reports has been disclosed to core participants. It's dated the 27th of March, 2024, and has the URN EXPG 606. It sets out the expected and best practice in relation to the standards of governance, management, and leadership in companies such as the post office in the period 1999 to 2019. It's a substantial body of work being 133 pages in length, including its appendices. A copy of that um, report, the first report, is to be treated as being having read into the record today, and therefore a copy will be uploaded to the inquiry's website today. Uh, Dame Sandra and Dr. Stewart will be considering the evidence given in phases five and six of the inquiry, both the written evidence and the oral evidence, and will produce a second report in the light of that evidence when phases five and six have concluded. Thank you, Mr. Beer. I think we can all agree that is a brighter note. Uh, can I call Alan Bates, please? Yes, of course. Ah, he's appeared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right, repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Bates. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Beer, as you know, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you tell us your full name, please? Uh, Alan Bates. Thank you very much for previously providing a comprehensive and detailed witness statement to the inquiry and for coming to London today to give evidence to assist the inquiry um, in its work. Can we start by looking at your witness statement, please? Sure. Um, it's the only hard copy document I'm going to be asking you to refer to. It's got, for the purposes of the transcript, the URN WITN 305100, and it's up on the screen. It's 59 pages long, um, excluding the exhibits page, and is dated the 29th of February. Um, I picked up a couple of typos. I wonder whether we could just correct those first. If we look at page 23, and the foot of page 23 at uh, paragraph 75, um, uh, it says the CWU were not involved in this period, as I recall, the NFSP in the letter, should that say from Colin Baker? Yes, it should. Dated the 13th of January. So cross out the words January 200 and put in the words Baker, the word okay. Baker. Yes? Yes, please. And page 32. Uh, paragraph 102. It says in my letter to Mr. O'Neill, dated the 9th of September 2009, I think that should be 2004. The original letter. Yes, it would be, yes. Yes, so can that be corrected to 2004, thank you. If you can turn to page 59, please, in the hard copy. Um, do we see your signature there? 
Yes, you do. And with those two typos corrected, are the contents of the statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. Thank you very much, Mr Bates. I'm not going to ask you questions about every aspect of your witness statement because it's long and detailed and a copy of it will be uploaded to the inquiry's website today so the public can um, read it. Can I start? The statement can come down, please. Um, can I start with um, a little bit about your background? Uh, you tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph five, no need to turn it up, uh, that before you became a sub-postmaster, you worked for 12 years in the heritage and leisure project management sector. Is that right? That's correct. And is it right that in the course of um, that work, you developed experience in electronic point-of-sale EPOS systems? Yes, I did. Uh, you developed experience in the development of site-specific business software and the provision of staff IT training? That's correct. Uh, to what extent, uh, if any, did that background assist you when you became a sub-postmaster and were later required to work with the Horizon IT system? I think when Horizon came in, I think I was quite positive about it um, because I, I knew what technology and these sorts of systems could do. So um, I, I was quite positive. But I, I found it a bit frustrating once the system was installed and we were operating. I, I found there were many shortcomings in the system. And um, knowing what these systems could do, it just seemed a bit of a lost opportunity. You were a sub-postmaster, I think, between the 31st of March 1998 and the 5th of November 2003. Yes. Uh, by my reckoning, so a period of five and a half years or so. That's correct. Uh, and by comparison, if you don't mind me saying, to other sub-postmasters, that's a relatively short period, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I, sorry, I, it is, but it's due to post office, not to myself. Qu quite. <laughs> and also, I suppose, uh, ironically, you spent more than four times that period campaigning. Oh, yes. Yeah. And why has that been necessary? Um, <clears throat> Because, uh, well, initially it was because post office terminated my contract, giving me three months' notice, and not giving me a reason for doing so. Um, purely because, in my belief, is that it was, I kept raising problems and concerns over its horizon system due to a number of faults I'd found over the years. You tell us in your statement that you spent um, that period of time seeking justice, accountability, and redress for not just yourself and your uh, wife, but also on behalf um, of a much wider group of people. Is that right? Yes, I did. Um, we, um, once I'd started my individual little campaign in there, <coughs> we, we found others along the way, and eventually we all joined up, and so the JFSA was born, and onwards at the campaign. You say in your witness statement that you have dedicated this part of my life to this cause. Is that how it has <clears throat> seemed or felt? That well, it, first, yeah. Firstly, that it, it's required dedication, but secondly, it's a cause. Yeah, I think it's also stubbornness as well. But um, it's... I mean, as you got to meet people and realised it wasn't just yourself and you saw the harm and injustice that had been um, descended upon them, uh, it, it was something that you felt you had to deal with. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's something you felt you had to deal with. It's something you couldn't put down. And um, <clears throat> you had the support of the rest of the group in there as well. Sorry. That's right. Do take a moment to... Uh, clear the frog in your throat. Yeah, I have. <coughs> Hopefully not a Welsh one. There we go. <laughs> Talking of which, um, you ran a post office in North Wales. Um, I did. What was the name of the post office and uh, in which town was it? It's Craigadon Post Office in Llandidno. Just say that again. <laughs> Craigadon Post Office in Llandidno. Uh, what kind of post office? Like me teasing him about those names. Ah, I see. 
Uh, what kind of post office was it? It was well. It, it, it was a three-position counter. In that it was uh, when we first um, bought the property, it was very much at the back of the, the property in there, and it was a bit run down. And it also had another side, and um, a retail side to the business, which was a whole variety of things: crafts, knitting, um, haberdashery, a, a whole range of, of things. So. For the first year or two, we just ran the business as it was and slowly developed it from there, putting on a big extension, up, updating, the, um, updating a lot of the stock. But more importantly, we actually saw it as a, a, a big potential to, to grow the post office business, and we brought it right to the front of the building and with a... Uh, <laughs> A large queuing area for, for people, unfortunately, it seems what post offices need. And um, uh, so we, we invested quite heavily in developing the post office, and that was at the time Horizon came in. Thank you. And I think you and your wife, Suzanne, were 44 years old when you took it over, is that right? About that, yes. Yeah, sort of you tell us in your witness statement that there's no need to turn it up, it's paragraphs 9 to 13. Okay in summary terms, um, about your decision to become a sub-postmaster, your decision to pick this post office, uh, your hopes and aspirations, and the process by which you applied and by which your application was approved. I just want to look at an account you've given in the past in more detail about that, sure. if we may. Um, can we look, please, on the screen at poll 3024194? <clears throat> this is a witness statement you made in the course of the um, group litigation proceedings in the High Court. Um, we'll deal more about that later today. Uh, is that right? Yes, it is. Yes. And we can see the date on it in the top right, um, 9th of August 2018. And so this witness statement was made for the purposes of what came to be known as the Common Issues Trial, is that right? That's correct. And so the process by which you applied to become a sub-postmaster, the documents that were or, in fact, were not given to you, were important issues and addressed in this witness statement in very de great detail, is that right? That is right, yeah. Can we look, please, at uh, page three? and pick up at paragraph 11, please. You say a key attraction to working with the post office was that it would provide secure employment based upon the fact it provides a community service and has an established brand in the community. From among the various small business options available, a post office branch would, in my mind, be a safe option. I was also encouraged by the fact I could run a secondary business such as a retail shop alongside the post office branch. That sets out in summary your reasons for picking post office as a, um, a future enterprise with your wife. Is that right? That's correct. Now, um, paragraph 12 on this page, right through to um, paragraph 23 on page 5, addresses the initial inquiries you made with the existing or the outgoing sub-postmaster, Peter Savage, I think his name was. That's correct. Um, and the planned visits that you made and indeed some unannounced visits that you made to the post office in question as part of your due diligence, is that right? That's correct. Can we just look at paragraph 21 on page 5, please? you say that you do remember that during one of my visits um, to the branch, Mr. Savage explained that he had a practice of keeping unders and overs in a tin in the safe as a system to deal with any odd shorts or overs. I remember this because I thought it to be rather casual and unusual for a business. Nevertheless, I was not particularly concerned and considered it to be a matter for Mr. Savage and his staff, and I didn't understand it to involve large figures or to be... Um, uh, problematic. Is that right? 
That is right, and it was very odd and very strange, I thought, for a, for a cash-based um, system uh, where you didn't actually record anywhere the amounts um, and you didn't, you didn't provide post office with returns of the position each week in there as well. But, you know, that seemed to be the way it operated. But these were small sums of money, is that They were small sums of money, yeah. Uh, on, um, from paragraph 24, if we scroll down, please... Um, right through to paragraph 33 at the bottom of page 7, you deal with the agreement to purchase the post office. Yes? Yes. And then if we go forward to page 8, please. Um, from paragraph 34 on this page, uh, right through to uh, paragraph 86 on page 19, you deal with the following issues. I'm just going to summarise them without reading the text. Firstly, the application to the post office to be a sub-postmaster. Secondly, the interview at the regional office in Bangor that you and your um, wife attended. Thirdly, um, the confirmation that your application had been successful and the material that you were then given. Yes? And if we just go forward to page 15, please. And look at paragraph 62. You say, at no stage during the process of my application, appointment, and branch opening uh, was I ever um, sent a copy of the sub-postmaster contract. I first obtained a copy of the sub-postmaster contract much later in circumstances I explained below. At no point during my appointment process was it mentioned or explained to me that the sub-postmaster contract, which was a lengthy document of 114 pages, governed the terms of my um, appointment. Now, we'll hear later that, uh, is this right, that the post office robustly challenged you on that issue alongside other issues at the trial, and then the trial judge, then Mr Justice Fraser, held that you were an honest witness, that you were telling the truth, and that, like many other sub-postmasters, you did not receive a copy of this document. That's correct. You address later in this section of your witness statement your initial classroom uh, uh, training, and then lastly, the transfer of the branch to you and the opening of it. Correct? Correct, yes. Can we turn to the um, introduction of the Horizon system into your branch? And can we go to your inquiry witness statement, please, at page five? <clears throat> at paragraph 14, you tell us that in uh, October 2000, the post office introduced Horizon at my branch and imposed upon me a requirement that I use it to record transactions at the branch and to submit uh, branch accounts. To the best of my recollection, Horizon was installed from the 2nd of October 2000. I remember the branch was closed around this time to um, allow for this. Uh, so uh, Horizon installed um, under two years after you took up uh, the position of sub-postmaster of this office. Correct. And then scroll down to 15, please. You say, um, I didn't have any involvement in discussions about the introduction of Horizon. I had no choice but to accept and accommodate this variation. Obviously, this was also a huge change in how I operated the branch, as many of the previous processes that I've been trained on and had operated at the branch were made obsolete, not only for me, but also for my... Um, assistance. Um, paragraph 16, please. <coughs> you say, um, when Horizon was introduced, given my background with electronic point of sale systems, uh, I regarded the introduction of Horizon at first as a positive innovation. And you've told us that yeah. uh, in summary this morning. <coughs> However, I did not expect there to be any apparent discrepancies shown on the system that I was unable to identify the cause of and resolve, either by myself or with support or information from Post Office Limited. 
Certainly, I did not expect discrepancies to occur for which the post office would try and hold me liable without the cause being investigated and established. To that point, I'd been preparing accounts manually using the capture system. Just going back to um, at what you say on the previous page, you say in the third line, I didn't expect there to be any apparent discrepancies shown on the system that you were unable to identify the cause of and resolve. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> well, um, I expected to be able to track down any transaction uh, um, that I'd undertaken, uh, myself or my staff had undertaken at the branch. <coughs> um, one way or another, there are a variety of ways of interrogating systems and the data on the systems, and I presumed that the system would enable you to do that at the outset. But, um, I mean, in, in, in previous roles, you know, before post office, <coughs> I'd use something like crystal reports on software packages to, to, um, to extract information uh, using certain parameters in there. But there was very little flexibility in Horizon, as I saw it at that time, um, for reports that you could control the, the um, parameters of your searches for. There were a set of reports, don't get me wrong, there were a set that were already built into the system but they were quite restrictive in there, and um, it, it did seem to cause problems. And um, we see this as a feature in the correspondence that you um, we're going to turn to a little later sure. um, today, and a constant theme that you pursued, i.e. the visibility of transactions and the auditability of transactions um, <clears throat> from a sub-postmaster's perspective was lacking in the Horizon system, is that correct? Very much so, yeah. Uh, can we um, uh, turn, please, uh, back to your High Court statement, poll 3024194. And um, turn to page 32, please. Can we pick it up at uh, paragraph um, 144? Uh, you say that you've been referred to a part of the post office's um, um, defense and to its defense and counterclaim. And you say that you understand from this that the post office's case for the purposes of the common issues trial is, quote, that losses do not arise in the ordinary course of things without fault or error on the part of sub-postmasters and their assistants. And, um, this is what the post office said, it would not be right to infer or presume that a shortfall and loss was caused instead by a bug or error in Horizon. And, quote, that the truth of whether a shortfall did or did not result from losses for which the sub-postmaster was responsible, quote, lies peculiarly within the knowledge of sub-postmasters as the person with the responsibility for branch operation and the conduct of transactions in branches. You say, um, these things were in my own experience very far from the case. And then you set out from your own experience um, uh, 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 by comparison um, what you say by reference to what the post office suggests. Can we look at paragraph 145, please? You say, I um, didn't expect there to be any apparent shortfalls that you were unable to identify. That's essentially what you said in your um, inquiry witness statement. And then 146, you say, one of my fundamental concerns when Horizon was introduced, which you clearly communicated through various letters, was the lack of transparency and control available to me in reviewing transactions when trying to balance. You refer to a letter 
and you say, I could not fully access data that I needed in order to properly track and, if necessary, to correct transactions. Um, your concerns came to a head in December 2000 following a particularly difficult balance. You were therefore dependent, you say, upon the post office for this sort of information uh, and therefore in order to ascertain the cause of any apparent shortfall and whether it was in fact a real loss. And then you say in 147, although post office later moved to monthly balancing, during your tenure you were required to produce weekly accounts, which meant you had to conduct a balance on a weekly basis on a Wednesday. When carrying out this balance on Wednesday the 13th of December 2000, the Horizon system showed there was an unexplained variance of over £6,000 relating to um, gyro deposits. That can come down, thank you. So the first substantial unexplained variance was over, over £6,000, is that right? Yes, and it was only a number of weeks after the system had gone live. Well, I was going to ask you that. Um, system live um, about the 2nd of October. Yeah. We're now talking about the 13th of December, so two months or so yeah. after the system had been installed, this variance arose. Yes. Um, if we go back to um, paragraph 148, please, of poll 3024194. Over the page, please. Thank you. You say, as you mentioned in a paragraph above, I contacted the helpline seeking support and help as to why this apparent variance had occurred. They were unable to assist in any meaningful way. I tried to investigate the matter myself. I printed various reports from two of my three counter terminals. I left the third terminal for use to serve customers who, as we were very busy in the branch with customers queuing out of um, the door. Um, you cross-refer back to paragraph 143.1. I'm not going to um, go there. But essentially you tell us in that paragraph that on that day, the 13th of December 2000, you contacted the helpline seven times. Is that right? That's correct. And one of the calls was um, about an hour, an hour in length. Yeah. And were they of any assistance at all in that term, in those seven calls? N not really. Um, <laughs> the, the, stating the bleeding obvious, I think, really, is, is, is one description I might use. But it, I, it, it was all things that I'd tried. Um, there was Did they suggest anything? No, and the, the, the other impression I got is they, they, they couldn't access the system any further than I could at that time. And just by way of an aside, um, I think you tell us in your um, uh, statement that post office records subsequently disclosed to you show that in the two-year and nine-month period um, up, until, um, uh, February, uh, up until November 2003, i.e. when your contract was terminated, uh, you and your assistants made 507 calls to the helpline. Correct of which 85 related to horizon and balancing problems. Yes. And that you found the helpline to be ineffective, indeed of no help. Um, very much so, and often we never bothered ringing it. Can we go on to paragraph 149 of your High Court witness statement here? You say, using the limited reports you were able to uh, uh, print, you ascertain that around 5,000 pounds of the alleged shortfall related to gyro items that had become wrongly duplicated on Horizon. These were reports were in the form of lengthy, multi-line, narrow till receipts and were many metres long, making them difficult to review in any event. At the time, I believe that a majority of the remaining alleged shortfall, being £1,182.81, was also attributable to gyro errors. However, I was unable to track these potentially smaller sums in the absence of proper reporting functions on Horizon. Therefore, far from being within my knowledge, I was unable to ascertain the root cause of the apparent shortfall at all. Um, you have your thoughts, which you set out later. I also called my retail, line ma sorry, my retail network manager, Jerry Hayes, the following day to inform him. 
in the absence of a proper response from the post office, I carried out, I carried over the apparent shortfall from that week's cash account to the following week's cash account by transferring it to a suspense account, which was visible to um, the post office. So um, five thousand pounds of the six thousand pounds was um, attributable to wrongly duplicated uh, at gyros. At the loss which had been left, about eleven hundred pounds. Um, you uh, couldn't account for on the information available to you. And is it that sum, £1,100, that you ended up in dispute with the post office over? At that time, yes, yeah. it was, yeah. And I think the first thing you did was to write a detailed letter to the post office about it. I did. Yeah. Can we look at that, please? Poll 404598. At page 134, please. We can see this is dated the 19th of December 2000, so about six days after the balancing issue emerged, and again about two and a bit months after the installation of Horizon at your branch. And um, it, it must be noted, I think, uh, very early in the life of the Horizon system taken as a whole, would you agree? Yes, sir. You'll see that the heading of it is um, Horizon Faults. Uh, can we read the letter together? Because this sets out um, what might be an important account early in the life of Horizon. Uh, you refer back in the first paragraph to a, um, a conversation and um, as um, is good practice, you confirmed it in detail in writing. Uh, you say the balance at this office on the 13th was not only very stressful, but also very worrying. The evidence that appeared during that day proved beyond any doubt that the horizon system cannot be relied on, upon to give 100% accurate figures. The problem which was highlighted to this office that day was with regard to gyro deposits, and at one point the weekly returns were showing a variance to the addition of the daily returns of over £6,000. The whole of that afternoon was spent making a number of phone calls to the different helplines, one of almost one hour long, and kept two of the three terminals producing nothing but reports at a peak trading time when we had queues out of the door though eventually I did manage to track down the majority of the money. That said, the cash account for that week is still showing a shortage of 118281. I can without any doubt attribute 36850 of that to gyro items that have been double entered and that I'm unable to track because of the way Horizon is set up. Of the remaining 81431 shortage, I'm presuming that 40915 of that shortage is from the previous week that's become added to the total. This leaves a difference of 40516, which I am, um, I'm unsure of where it comes from. It may well be a gyro system error, as might be the previous week's 40915 shortage, or it may be something else. Unfortunately, the current Horizon system does not let you access previous transactions adequately enough to track problems with shorts or overs at the end of the week, continuing. Having spoken to the local branch secretary of the Federation of Sub-Postmasters on these problems and realising the problems I'm experience, experiencing are being found by others around the country, I, do not, I really do not believe it would be unreasonable for Post Office Network to hold me liable for losses on the cash account until such time as 100% guarantee can be given about the accuracy of Horizon. I've been hoping to leave any comments in writing about Horizon until the office is quieter in January and then write a detailed submission about the costs we've incurred with it, around a thousand pounds, the problems with the counter, staff working with money and stamp books on chairs or on the shelf behind them, the very poor layout of the screen and menus, the slowness of the printers, the lack of report writing facilities the chaotic end of day and end of week procedures and the problems of having to do, quote, office work at a terminal on the counter. 
Given time, I shall produce the report for you. Please do not think that I'm being nothing but negative about the system. I'm a firm believer in the way forward through such a system. But bear in mind my comments are made by someone who's had considerable experience of electronic point of sale systems before joining the post office in 1998. I first began working with them in 1986 and used a variety of systems. Reading on, so I do have some insight into those systems and I would gladly be willing to offer constructive feedback if asked. With regard to the current deficit showing on our cash account for last week, how do you want me to progress this week's balance? Should I just roll it through and see what happens or what? And then you ask for assistance. So in that letter, you make it clear on a number of occasions that Horizon is full, at fault, and you explain in detail why, so far as you could tell, that was so. Is that right? That's correct. You tell the post office that you are not alone and that this was happening around the country. That's what I understood, yeah. Did that information come from your local branch secretary at the NFSP? It did. Was that Dave Foster? It was Dave Foster. And you ask a question, what should I do at the end? Yes. Did you ever get a reply, a written reply, no. to the raft of the points? Sorry, no, I never did. No reply to this letter at all? Never. Can we move on, please? Um, uh, to page 140 in this bundle. This is um, a follow-up letter of the 7th of January 2002. So now over a year has passed. and you're writing to the post office about this um, long in the tooth alleged shortfall. And you say, as you're aware, the cash account for this office is still showing an amount of uh, 104186 in the suspense account. This cumulative figure was placed in the suspense account towards the end of 2000. And I have no doubt at all that it was due to errors in the horizon system over a number of weeks at that time. In my letters, to Jerry Hayes of the 19th of December, which we've just looked at, um, 16th of July 2001. I've skipped over that one because of time. Neither of which did I receive a written reply to. I gave further details on this matter. I really do think that enough time has now passed for post office to have resolved this issue, and that unless I receive a written comment to the contrary by the end of this month, I'll take it the matter's closed. When I signed my contract with post office counters, I did not sign to accept the liabilities arising from the shortcomings of a less than adequate horizon system. All liabilities from such a system are clearly the responsibility of Post Office Limited or ICL Pathway. Allowing this issue to drag on not only continues the stress and strain of the original problems, but I fear also continually cast doubt over my honesty and that of my staff. Therefore, I greatly appreciated it, it if you would bring this matter to a head in order that we can um, move on. Can um, we turn to your inquiry witness statement, please? At paragraphs 39 and 40, which um, are on page 12. You say, finally, by letter of the 6th of March, 2002, I was notified that, quote, post office has decided to take no further action in respect of the loss at my branch and that this will be written off. Uh, no reason was given, but I've since seen a copy of a, quote, write-off authority voucher disclosed by the post office, which gives the reason for the write-off as, quote, disputed horizon cash account shortage. The letter of the 6th of March also said that the post office had taken time to respond because, quote, it has been necessary to formulate a consistent response to all such cases. I take it from this that the post office was aware at the time of many such complaints. I also take uh, from the fact that the post office was willing to write off the considerable and apparent discrepancy I disputed that my complaints were valid and that the post office was aware that was the case and wished to avoid the controversy on this matter given that I was willing to assert my legal rights. 
can we turn up, please, um, poll 404598 at page 143, please. We should just um, look back at um, page 142, please. This is the letter of the 6th of March 2002 that you were referring to in your witness statement. Yes. And um, if we look at the third paragraph, there's the passage that you cited after due consideration of the facts surrounding your loss in your report, post office has decided to take no further action in respect of the loss which will be written off. And the right of authority, if we just look at the second page that was included, if we just scroll down a little bit, thank you. This is the, the unsigned version, essentially. Yeah. Um, I've received a write-off authority um, voucher to the value of the amount which has been cleared from my suspense account and the voucher has been cleared in the appropriate manner in the cash account number, week number, I'm sorry. Uh, was that amount, 104186, actually cleared out of your suspense account, so you went back to zero in balancing terms? Yes. yes. So it didn't remain there after a shortfall, which you were required to roll over? No. And then can we look at the loss authorization document, which you also referred to in your uh, witness statement? That's poll 8099. Uh, page three, please. I think this is the loss authorization document. If we just pan out so we can see all of it, please. I don't think this is something that you saw at the time. Is that right? This is an internal post office document. That's correct. Um, but you got disclosure of it later. Is that right? That's right. And we'll see that it seems to be in standard form. <laughs> It's got your branch name and your FAD code, the amount of money. And it says the following decision has been made with regard to the loss at the above office, which relates to an aged shortage, which the sub postmaster insists was attributable to a Horizon system software equipment training failure. And then three boxes, or three options are given. The second of which was the sub postmaster makes it good. The third of which, um, an amount of it must be made good, an amount of it will be written off, and the first of which was the full amount will be written off and the post, uh, sub postmaster has been sent the appropriate voucher with which to clear the loss of the amount. Yes? Yes. Um, did you um, see this document, that um, the, the writing off of a loss because you said the loss was attributable to the Horizon system at the time of the dispute with the post office in 2002 and 2003, i.e. before termination of your contract? No, no, I didn't see it. And so were you aware at that time that the post office um, seemingly used the standard form um, with delete as appropriate boxes on it? No, no I didn't. But now that you mention it, I, I do recall a conversation that the retail network manager had at the time with this department at my office. So I only heard one side of the conversation. And it was about arranging for this write-off amount or a write-off voucher. And I seem to recall, and it's stuck in memory because of what it was, he said, oh, it's another one, the horizon losses. And it's just one of those little things that, you know, sticks in the back of your mind that happened, that was said at the time when, when the retail manager was speaking to this department on the phone arranging the voucher. 
in any event, there existed a form in which a loss um, could be authorised to be written off on the grounds um, that the sub-postmaster said the loss was attributable <laughs> to Horizon. Yes, it did. And that's what happened in your case? Yes. Thank you. That can come down. <coughs> now, before you um, uh, had authorization to write this loss off, you continued to roll it over from week to week? Yes, I did. And was that done with the knowledge and approval of your then retail line manager? Well, they were aware of it. They certainly informed that that's what I was doing. So. We've heard um, from some post office staff um, the evidence of um, Susan Harding um, springs to mind, particularly to me, um, that the post office believed that the suspense account was used by sub-postmasters to cover up theft and fraud. Y your evidence is that you were being transparent from an early stage in the life of Horizon uh, in your complaints about Horizon discrepancies about the use of the suspense account to hold over <coughs> disputed sums whilst, continued, whilst continuing to assert that the money wasn't owed and ought not to be made good, is that right? That's correct. Did there come a time when that practice was challenged? Um, not during my tenure. I understand it was later on. I think after this write-off, um, there continued to be um, some shortages, shortfalls, shown on Horizon. Is that right? That is. That's right, yes. Well, and just, sorry, um, you, you say shortages. It was also overs and unders. It was so surpluses as well? Surpluses, yeah. <clears throat> and did you seek to discover the um, cause of both the surpluses and the shortages? Yes, um, as much as we could. And did you um, encounter success? On occasion, yes. Uh, did it remain the case, however, that a sum just over um, a thousand um, pounds was carried as um, a shortage in a, the suspense account? Uh, no, not, not to my recollection. There was a claim at the very end of my um, contract that I think they said that the um, office was owing something in the region of twelve or fourteen hundred pound, but is that I'm referring to? Sorry, it's that I was referring to. Yeah, no, it, it, but that wasn't carried out. Such. What happened was that I refused to. Um, <clears throat> um, when we when we undertook our weekly balance, you were then meant to put in money to make up to the figure or take money out if it, it was over in there. I refused to do that. <clears throat> I rolled through the shortages or the losses in there. So, uh, sorry, shortages or the overs each time. So it had a, a running total. It, it was adjusted from week to week um, because I really did not know where the office was up to. You know, I had no idea. So, and often some of these um, where there had been an error might come back in a week or two weeks or something of that um, that sort of time, or it could be a lot longer, um, when the actual error was discovered elsewhere and it can be corrected. Um, but no, I never actually reset um, or zeroed the system, but I just kept rolling through the shortages and losses. And post office were aware of what I was doing. Uh, did um, the um, installation of a new retail line manager, Mike Wakeley, um, cause matters to uh, be brought to a head in that respect? Eventually, yes. And can we look at that eventually? Um, poll 404598, uh, page 144, please. This is a letter to you dated um, the 14th of April 2003, um, reference losses and gains. Um, just want to read the first part of the first paragraph. Further up to our conversation, you confirm that you've been rolling over losses and gains for the past two years or more. Um, that's um, what you've just described. Yes. Uh, he says, I was unaware of this practice. 
And then in the second paragraph, he says, I'm now instructing you that with immediate effect, you're required to make good the outstanding loss and to cease with this current practice of rolling over any losses and gains. Can we see your reply, please? Uh, page 145. You say, I'm rece in receipt of your letter, the 14th of April, that's the one we've just read, confirming our conversation regarding losses and gains at our office, which have always been rolled over since the installation of Horizon. I appreciate you may well have been unaware of this practice at the office, but can assure you that many others at post office, uh, mo many other post office staff knew of it. Uh, my comments regarding this were all well documented in a number of letters, uh, such as that dated the 19th of December, which, like all letters, uh, were sent recorded delivery. Uh, the problem with rolling over the losses and gains is that I presume I'd be accepting um, uh, liability for them, which is something that I've pointed out in writing to you since the introduction of Horizon here. I'm unable to do until such time as I'm able to access the data that I'm being asked to be responsible for. As I've written previously, the totally inadequate report system has been made so complex it lacks the ability to interrogate the system when you know the information is inside. If I'm unable to access the data to check items, it's totally unreasonable to expect me to accept liability from uncheckable um, uh, data. I think that reply um, uh, speaks for itself. But did this exchange of correspondence, the new-ish, I think, retail line manager raising the issue, requiring you to make good the shortfall, to cease the practice, ultimately led, lead to your contract being terminated? I believe so, yeah. uh, Can we look, please, at page 147 of this bundle? <coughs> um, letter um, from Mr. Wakeley, um, 2nd of May, scroll down. Thank you for your letter of the 16th of April. That's the one we've just looked at, the contents of which have been noted. Nevertheless, I must point out uh, that you are bound by the terms and conditions of your contract for services, which was acknowledged by you on the 31st of March 2003, and somebody's written in not correctly, I think 1998. That was you, was it? Yes. 1998, exclamation mark, um, accepting your appointment. Um, to this effect, you're charged with ensuring that all accounts entrusted to you are kept in the form prescribed by post office using the approved accounting system. And therefore, in the event of any losses occurring, these should be made good without delay. Accordingly, failure to comply with these obligations can be construed as a breach of contract, which could ultimately put your contract for services at risk over the page. I therefore request that you acknowledge the content of the letter within 10 days of its posting, confirming that the accounts are being maintained in the correct fashion and make good the losses as per your contractual um, obligations. And then 149, please. Uh, your reply to that letter. With regard to your letter of the 2nd of May, the first paragraph, I think you pick him up on the typo. Um, you refer me to section 12 of the contract. And rather than what he has suggested to you, you're liable to repay all losses, you point out that section 12 in fact um, states, the sub postmaster is responsible for all losses caused through his own negligence, carelessness or error, and also for losses of all kinds caused by his assistance. Deficiencies due to such losses must be made good without delay. You rightly point out that I've agreed these terms, I confirm I gladly make good any losses caused in these manner. Um, but I can see nothing in this clause which states that I'm also liable for data I'm unable to check. And that's a summary of the position that you had been maintaining, I think, consistently since installation. Yes. To take an extreme, if the Horizon system said I owed a million pounds, would you say I'd have to make good the loss without delay and without question? There's no way I will agree to be held responsible for data I have input until um, such time as I'm able to access the data that I'm, asked, I'm being asked to be responsible for. In trying to state that I've acknowledged such things as terms and conditions of my contract, you're in effect purporting to vary this contract. Um, uh, we can skip over the next paragraphs, which are about something else. 
and then go to the uh, next page, 148, sorry, 150, and then the letter ends. So um, you, you correct the post office on the terms and conditions. You make it clear the point that many have missed, that the contract uh, does not oblige you to repay all losses. Um, and then um, you make a point of emphasis, the million pounds example, in your third paragraph. Was there any um, effort by the post office to engage with the points that you were making in this letter? None at all. Never addressed them. Can we turn, please, to poll 404598, um, page 30. That's the same bundle. Page 30. Scroll down, please. Mr. Wakeley, in accordance with your contract, I'm writing to issue you with three months' notice of termination of your contract. The termination will take effect on the 5th of November 2003. So um, this is the letter that um, brought your um, contract to an end, is that right? That is correct, yes. The letter, of course, speaks for itself. Um, it gave you no... Um, explanation for the reason for termination of your contract. That's correct. Yep. But was any such explanation given to you by the post office at this time? Never. Um, it may seem an insensitive question, but how did receiving this notice make you feel? Well, I, I was annoyed with them, but... Um, <sighs> to put it mildly. Um, but... I think it was partly expected in a way because it was pretty de pretty obvious they were determined to uh, they were after me one way or another and um, the build up of correspondence over the period was certainly pointing in that direction uh, but I always find it quite interesting that uh, I pulled them up on the point about um, trying to terminate me terminate me at my contract under clause 12 or uh, of the contract but they didn't do it that way. They decided to go for, uh, they decided to go just under this, you know, any reason they wanted, uh, three months' notice without giving a reason. Um, so it's a without fault, without reason. That's right. Yeah. Um, termination, exactly. just on three months' written notice. Yeah, that's it. But you'd had the £1,100 1, <laughs> written off. Mm -hmm. um, you'd had the post office acknowledging that it was because of a genuine dispute over whether Horizon was to blame for it, over the operation of Horizon. You'd been rolling over other shortfalls and surpluses since then with post office knowledge, and then this arrives. Well, it, it, was, <laughs> it, it was a bit strange in a way because we were um, a very busy post office. In fact, it was a time when uh, a lot of post offices were, were losing trade, but our sales figures were, were extremely high in the region. We developed a lot of new business in there, but you know it, it was their decision to do it, and so be it. Uh, I mean, I did offer, I did offer at one point um, when there were discussions between the retail manager and myself when we were heading in this direction. He was saying, "Come on, Alan, you know, change your mind, do this, do that, and all the rest of it." And I'm saying, look, if you're unhappy with the way that I'm providing your service, then pay us back our in initial investment and take the post office away. I would have been quite happy for, for them to do that. And I probably wouldn't have been here today <laughs> on that basis. Though. But, I mean, it's... it's um, they, they just decided they were going to... I, I felt they were, they were going to make um, a lesson of my case, because a number of other people knew what was going on at that time. And I, I think it was something the post office liked to try and give lessons of how they were in charge. Can we just look before the morning break um, at some reasoning that the post office gave subsequently for terminating your contract? Um, to start with, can we look at poll um, 0010-7538?
and page 11, please. Um, this is um, a letter uh, written to an MP, Betty Williams, um, in relation to a letter that she wrote as a constituency MP to Alan Layton, the then chairman of the post office. Um, and it's the 29th of October. Um, if we just go to the second page, scroll down, we can see who it's written by. Dave Barrett, Head of Commercial Urban Area for Wales, the Marches and Merseyside. Back to page one. And look at the second paragraph. And briefly, we've given notice to Mr Bates, the present sub-postmaster, that we're withdrawing from our contract with him. And then this. This is because we've lost confidence in his willingness to conduct the job in the manner expected. Was that ever explained to you? that they had lost confidence in your willingness to conduct, conduct the job in the no, manner expected. Can we look, please, at poll 3031815? This is a presentation on horizon integrity prepared by um, Dave Smith. It, it's undated, and it seeks to tell a story about the um, um, integrity of Horizon. Um, it, it's, um, we may find in due course, an interesting account overall, but I would just want to look at um, what it says about you on page six. And scroll down, please. Uh, Mr. Smith says, of the cases I'm aware, Bates had discrepancies, was dismissed because he became unmanageable. Was that ever explained to you, that you became unmanageable? No, not at all. And then Mr. Smith says of you that you, quote, clearly struggled with accounting and despite copious support, did not follow instructions. Uh, firstly, did you struggle with accounting? No, no, not at all. Were you given copious support? <laughs> no. Did you seek to follow um, the instructions that you had been given by the post office? Well, basically try and bank bankrupt myself. No, I didn't, so not to that extent. If these... Um, that can come down, thank you. If these after-the-fact reasons or justifications for the termination of your contract are not, on your understanding, correct, what do you understand to be the reason for the termination of your contract? Well, well I mean, basically, I think it was because, A, they didn't like me standing up to them in the first instance. B, they were finding it awkward. And C, I don't think they could answer these questions. And I think they had a feeling I was going to carry on in a similar vein going forward. Uh, just lastly then, can we look at um, poll 3024194? This is your witness statement. Can we look at paragraph 170? I'm afraid I haven't written which page that is. Try about 25. Uh, hopeless. Um, try about 30. Try about 35. And then if you can scroll forward to paragraph 170, please. Yep, 
you say this is your High Court statement for the GLO Common Issues trial. Um, I've little doubt that the reason for my termination is that I had not only uncovered limitations and potential errors with the Horizon system, but that I continued to question the post office on the contractual relationship between sub-postmasters and the post office. Was that your belief at the time? Yeah, it, it, it's a good summary of how it felt. Yeah. Does it remain your belief now? Oh, yes. Mr Bates, thank you. Can we take the morning break, please? Yes. There's a slight um, glitch with the transcription service, which I think means we need to take 20 minutes rather than our usual 15. All right, so, so what time shall we resume? I think that means um, 5 to. 5 to 12. All right, see you, you all sir. then. <laughs>
Uh, so, good morning. Uh, if we continue, please, yeah. Mr. Bates, with um, August 2003, uh, you remember where we are in the um, narrative. You've been given um, notice of um, termination of your contract. And I think one of the first things you did was to write to the chairman of the Royal Mail Group PLC. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, can we look at that letter, please? Um, poll 0010 7538. Uh, we'll see that this is um, dated the 7th of August 2003 to Mr. Alan Layton, um, Chairman of Royal Mail Group PLC. Uh, we'll look at the detail in a moment, but can I ask you in general terms what the purpose was in writing to um, the Chairman of Royal Mail Group PLC? By this time you'd received Post Office's decision to terminate your contract. Um, what was the point? Well, I, I, I was still in post, if you like, for the next few months. So <coughs> I thought it was well worth trying to write to, to the chairman to make him aware of what was going on, um, because he may well um, have not known. So uh, I thought, hoping that he might be able to undertake some sort of review into it and look at the case for us or whatever, take it on board uh, a little bit more seriously. Uh, this is, of course, still... Um taking a step back relatively early um, in the entire narrative of the scandal, August 2003. Um, Horizon had only been rolled out for three years or so. Yeah, but it was wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I knew it was wrong then. There were things wrong with it. And, I, I, and having heard that others had had problems with it as well, surely someone should have been looking at all of this and taking these things into consideration. Well, in that sense, you're obviously right because many people were yet to be terminated. Many people were yet to be prosecuted. Many people were yet to be convicted and many people were yet to go to prison. Mm. Can we look at what you said to the chairman? Uh, first paragraph. Um, I'm writing to you with regard to a letter I've just received from Post Office Limited giving me formal notification of their decision to terminate my sub-postmaster contract. As chairman of the group responsible for Post Office Limited, I thought important that you should be aware of what is being undertaken in your name. Um, you very much personalise things in that first paragraph. Yes. Did you expect this letter to at least be seen by the person to whom you wrote it? I, cer I certainly hoped it would be. Um, yeah. um, I can't do more than draw their attention to it. I can't force them to read it. But um, if you don't write to them, then they'll never know. At paragraph two. Uh, please find enclosed a copy of that letter as well as copies of previous correspondence and notes regarding the problems in question. I'm not going to go through the previous correspondence or your notes upon it, which I've tried to keep in a chronological order. Uh, in reality, this matter should never have reached this stage, uh, uh, but the extremely poor handling by post office management in the past has led to the situation which could result um, in us not only losing our business, but something else. Um, unlike the uh, post office, I do not have endless funds to fight this injustice through the courts. Why was that in your mind at that stage, the relative funds available to each side to fight a case through the courts? Well, I suppose, realistically, I have been speaking with lawyers at that time, and um, I, I was being advised that you probably wouldn't be able to afford um, to take post office on. Um, it just, you know, it was just an impractical uh, situation from a financial point of view more than anything else, uh, regardless of the case. Uh, moving on to paragraph, uh, the rest of the paragraph. I do realize it's imperative for as many people as possible to have an opportunity to see the, um, uh, in detail, the management style applied by Royal Mail Group 
um, to the very public face of the local post office. It's again trying to use what seems to be so often described in its outdated Stalinistic management approach in order to bludgeon its will onto the poor sub-postmaster with an issue that could bankrupt every sub-post office in the country. Whilst I appreciate that principles can be expensive, I cannot agree to any position which would leave me and every other sub-postmaster liable for claims of millions of pounds from the post office without any redress or access to data to check such claims. Is that a reference to the um, auditability or visibility, the reporting function available to sub-postmasters on the system? Well, certainly the lack of it, yes. Uh, my only um, defence, until I can find an organisation willing to offer support, is to ensure that the media and all those politicians who represent a ward with a sub-post uh, sub office, as well as everyone who runs a sub-post office who, or, or who uses one, has an opportunity to read all the facts. To that end, these documents enclosed and others will shortly be available online once the um, hoarding at the f for the front of our building advertise advertising our website, www.postofficevictims.org.uk, is ready um, in a week or so. Originally, uh, I'd registered um, postofficevictim at .me.uk to use, but uh, as the launch will undoubtedly bring up many other cases from across the country, it was thought a larger and less personal site would be more um, appropriate over the page. It's important to make clear I've not breached my contract. I will not be ceasing to trade on the 5th of November 2003. If I did, I certainly would be in breach of my terms. Uh, uh, if you read the enclosed documentation, it's all self-evident. I'm sure you can tell my back is up against the wall. But until the, book, um, the hoarding is ready and in place and all the web pages are downloaded to the server, I welcome any option that will resolve this matter with the minimum of fuss without the national publicity this issue is bound to draw. Hence my letter to you as a last attempt to reach a sensible um, uh, conclusion. Now, I don't think you got a reply from um, Mr. Uh, Leighton, did you? No, um, I got one from his office. Uh, somebody did <coughs> acknowledge it, if I recall. Can we look at poll 3040354? Um, you can see this is the 27th of August. Thank you for your letter dated the 7th of August addressed to Alan Layton, which has been forwarded to me for reply. Uh, can we look at the um, second page, please? And scroll down. You'll can see, you can see that it's um, from somebody in the operations department, uh, Rhea McQueen, a case liaison manager. Go back to the first um, page, please. And then if we look um, in the second paragraph, she says, I've now completed my inquiries. They've taken longer than expected. And she says, I've spoken with a number of the personnel involved in the search for a solution to the situation um, at the branch, although I regret that the situation has re reached the point of termination of your contract. Quote, I am confident that the various teams concerned in the events have worked hard to provide support and assistance to you in a consistent and sympathetic manner. Was that your experience? No, but this is post office's view. It's not mine. Uh, this support included a number of on-site attendances to assist with balancing. Did that occur? Uh, the, I had two people visit to try and assist with balancing but they could access the, the system no further than I could, so it was absolutely no help at all. And also to provide extra training on the Horizon system. Did you get additional training on the Horizon system? Not that I can recall. But the aim was always that of achieving a solution to the difficulties you were experiencing in managing um, transactions and processes um, at the branch. Uh, the Horizon system at the branch has been reviewed and interrogated um, in response to your complaints. And the reports from the Horizon Field Support Team and the MBSC have confirmed that there's nothing inherently wrong with the Horizon system installed at the branch. But was the system installed at your branch, to your knowledge, um, reviewed and interrogated? 
Not that I'm aware of. No one ever came to the place. And I, I've always been confused over nothing inherently wrong. That turn of phrase, it just seems a little unusual. Nothing wrong, I can understand, but inherently wrong. It seems like a back-covering sort of uh, phrase. And then read on, please. If we scroll down, thank you. Um, the sub-postmaster contract is clear on the requirement that postmasters must make good loss or gains when misbalances occur. In fact, it isn't clear on that at all. That's a complete misstatement of the contract. Um, it's evident you've consistently refused to do this, um, even when specifically requested to do so by the area management team. Um, the contract um, also states that either party may terminate it with three months' notice without a reason being given, and that's what we've done. And then, I'm sure you've carefully considered the idea of your website. I feel you should be aware that use of the Post Office Limited's imagery on your website may constitute trademark um, infringement. You say um, in your witness statement that despite you having sent the chairman a full clip of the um, relevant correspondence with notes about each item within it, um, to quote your witness statement, predictably, the response of the post office was to ignore the content and predictably to fail to investigate the real issues. Why, in your view, was it that the predictable response of the post office? <coughs> it, it was the way they tried to deal with things. Um, which you experienced through their area manager. I mean, it, it was constantly a post office was in the right, and you were always in the wrong. And um, <laughs> uh, it was, it just seemed to be their nature. Um, you tell us in your um, witness statement that uh, this reply was the quote, usual box ticking exercise written entirely from the post office's perspective? Of course, yeah, that's what it was. But the last paragraph concludes, the management team has been wholly professional in the management, deliberation and investigation of your issues. Had, in fact, the issues that you raised been investigated at all? Not that I'm aware of. Can we turn to paragraph 52 of your witness statement, please? Your inquiry witness statement, which is page 16. We asked you a question, what data you believe you needed to access in order to determine the cause of discrepancies in the Horizon generated branch accounts. And you say, um, I required access to all data, even in a read-only format, held on the system in relation to all input by me and my staff, which happened at the branch. In respect of verifying information regarding those transactions, or the accounts that they ultimately formed a part of, I could only check transaction logs that were available on Horizon for limited periods of time or use the limited range of information and reports I had access to and which could be printed from Horizon terminals, comparing them to stock in the branch. I had no real way of checking information held in uh, Horizon that came from post office itself or from its clients, such as Camelot, or indeed the way in which uh, those had been reconciled with transactions in the branch. And then if we go um, further on, please. Uh, scroll down, please, to 54. Um, whilst the position as stated in the letter, that's the letter we've just read, um, is that they'd reviewed and interrogated and concluded there was nothing inherently wrong with the Horizon system, I'd seen no evidence of the apparent review and interrogation they'd claimed to carry out. I was still without the data, which I'd been requesting for a number of years, nor had they discussed their findings with me. I do not believe there was any investigation or evidence that the purported investigation had taken um, place. Have you seen any evidence to date that the purported investigation 
that's referred to in the letter sent on behalf of the chairman no, have taken any, place? Uh, no, I haven't. Have any ever seen claims that it taken place? So far as um, you know, was the data that you are speaking about in these paragraphs that you needed access to in order to understand the cause of an apparent uh, shortfall or an over common to all cases uh, in sub-post offices that um, you later came across, i.e. that no one could actually, in the post office branch, get access to the data they needed to see what had happened? Not, not, a, not that I'm aware of, anyway. You, I think, um, wrote to your MP, is that right? Correct. Can we look, please, um, at poll 304-0368? Uh, you tell us in um, uh, your witness statement that um, Uh, you wrote to your um, MP um, about your case, that's um, Miss Williams, is that right? That's right. Um, on the 27th of October 2003, and she in turn raised it with the post office and with the minister. Um, it, she received um, a reply um, saying that they had taken a decision to review the case in its um, entirety. Uh, you say that that was carried out behind closed doors and didn't involve any contact with you, is that right? That's correct. And then um, she um, wrote again um, to uh, Post Office and um, your MP, as a result of which Post Office wrote this letter on the 19th of January um, 2004. Um, and if we look at the um, second page, Oh, sorry, just scroll up to the bottom of the first page. We can see that it's written by Richard Barker, the then general manager of the commercial network. And go to the top, please. Um, he says to Betty Williams MP, I promised to write to you once a comprehensive review had been undertaken of the issues raised by you. That review has been completed by a senior manager within post office with considerable experience in the handling of disputes and subsequent appeals. The conclusions of that review, which I fully endorse, are that the termination of your contract was done following proper investigation, coupled with proper warnings and with appropriate offers of additional training and support. No evidence was found which in any way substantiates the various claims being made by Mr Bates. And Mr um, Barker uh, goes as far as saying that the decision to terminate your contract was not only correct, it was the only sensible option. The best way is to consider the matter closed. Again, were you um, involved in any such comprehensive review? No, and um, that was one of my big objections. No one ever came and spoke to me about it or tried to understand what the problem had been. It was, as I said before, or as I, it's been recorded, um, it was carried on behind closed doors. So we've seen you write to your MP, we've seen you write directly to um, Alan Layton and the reply, we've seen your MP write to post office and we've seen this um, reply trying to ask questions. Um, it, it's suggested in some parts of your witness statement that um, they were being um, shut down or fobbed off by the post office, is that your view? That's the, it seems to be the way the business works, yeah. Can we turn, please, to poll 0032-8099? And if we just pan out a little bit. It may be that um, these five paragraphs on this undated piece of paper are the comprehensive review um, that has been referred to in the correspondence. It may be, but I, I hadn't seen them until recent. No. I just want to look at what um, the author, Sandy Stephen, um, says. Um, 
they say, I've reviewed, if we scroll to the top paragraph, please, all the files from the data for Horizon installation until the termination of Bates' contract and read all the subsequent correspondence. Um, I've summarized the salient points. Following um, Bates' assertions against the Horizon system, there were clear attempts made by several people to ascertain, ascertain whether, uh, sorry, if there were systems problems. Eventually, it was decided to write off the debt, and a clear signal was given um, to Bates that all future losses would be recovered. Significantly further training and support was given to Bates at that time. Is that true? Well, it's true. If that's what it says, yes. Um, I meant in reality. Yeah, no, I'm afraid it wasn't that way. No. Um, later, it transpired, and Bates admitted um, that he continued to roll over losses. Um, did you have to admit to this, or were you, in fact, telling the line already, managers... Sorry, I already it? informed them. Yes. I was, and, I, you know, I wasn't hiding the fact at all. They were well aware of what I Okay, you, so later it transpired, and you admitted that you continue to roll over losses and had done um, so since the introduction of Horizon. He received a formal letter instructing him to stop the practice. That's true. We've seen that from Mr. Wakeley. Um, and make good any losses, that's also true. He did not, that's also true. Losses continued to be made and rolled over and the retail line manager sought advice from contracts and legal services before terminating the contract. Um, from the evidence contained in the files, it's clear that retail line conducted themselves correctly and acted in accordance with the rules. And then this, leaving aside the anecdotal evidence on file, which demonstrates Bates' unsuitability as a postmaster, was that ever put to you, that you were unsuitable to be a postmaster? No, but they'd appointed me in the first instance. Are you aware of what anecdotal evidence there might be which demonstrates your unsuitability to be a postmaster? If, I mean, I have records of that time which were statements from the retail network manager or my current retail network manager at that time, which was Mike Wakeley, to say how well the office was doing and, and well done for all the hard work. I mean, it's, it, it's a nonsense. I, this was just them flexing their muscle and just deciding they're right and I was wrong. Uh, they point out po post office has an absolute right to terminate um, a contract with three months notice. That's also one of the true statements in, um, in this document. It was done in this instance following proper investigation uh, formal warning coupled with support and additional training. Yet you, quote, continue to flaunt and ignore the legitimate instructions from your retail line manager. And then we see a sentence that um, gets cut into the letter that we've just read. The decision to terminate was not only right, it was the only sensible option, which is what led me to think that this was the comprehensive review and investigation that um, had been referred to. Um, it says that you continue to flaunt the legitimate instructions of the retail line manager. Did you flaunt <laughs> his instructions? No, I just pointed out what I was doing and the reasons why I was doing it. But they'd never respond to me. They'd never discuss the issue about data and data access and liability and how, uh, and how long that liability lasted for and all the rest of it. I, when I went into post office, it was sold to me at the time as you were in partnership with the business. But you very soon learned that this was a very one-sided partnership. I mean, basically, you do whatever you're told is, is, was your side of the partnership. And they just didn't seem to like it if you raised any queries, even no matter how justified they were. In... Um relation to this part of um, the narrative. Can we lastly please look at poll four zeros four five nine eight. At page um, three please. And scroll down please. 
This is um, part of a, um, a slew of correspondence that I'm not going to investigate in detail um, over whether you would continue to provide a service within the post office as an interim measure and the um, arrangements that were being made for the post office to come into the branch and take away what they say belonged to them. Um, you say, um, at no time did post office ever ask me if I would continue providing a service as an interim measure. I would not deny you did make a sort of request to use our premises and our facilities to have someone else come in to provide a service at a time when you'd taken away our livelihood, investment and savings. But as you don't seem to live in the real world, I can tell you that this was just received as an insult. It seems your organisation will do every, anything and everything to try and keep the failures of Horizon hidden, regardless of who they have to trample down on the way, such as us or our community. I can assure you of my continued and now increased resolve to bring the real facts of what is going on to those who will have no choice but to act, regardless of whether it takes years. In relation to the penultimate paragraph there, the, the post office would do anything and everything to try and keep the failures of Horizon hidden. Why do you think that they were, why did you think that they were trying to keep the failures of Horizon hidden? I think a number of reasons. First off, I think their, their field um, personnel didn't understand it to any great um, depth and they just seemed to follow the corporate mantra that Horizon is robust and that's it and everyone else is wrong. Um, they didn't seem to want to engage uh, in useful discussions about how to try and uh, improve things. They it, it, any that they did make, any approaches they made, were, were very much a surface. It was just for show, rather than for, to change things in any meaningful way. It was a variety. Of, it was a variety of things at that time. Is what you write in that paragraph um, was what you wrote in that paragraph based on your? own experience or were you drawing from wider experiences of others then? Well, first off, it, um, I had some experience of those types of systems and it, it was obvious it was extremely poorly designed and it, it didn't really do the job it was meant to and there were a huge amount of problems. And I kept on hearing problems, little problems from all sorts of people, um, uh, other sub-postmasters because I used to go to regional uh, federation meetings as well, and you did sit and chat, and, and everyone had a moan and a whinge about it. Uh, and you heard of stories of where people were literally taking their computers and the whole systems and leaving them on the pavement outside and telling post office to come and collect it. Those were the sort of stories that were running around at the time in there. Uh, but. It was, I think it was the lack of real engagement in all of this to try and resolve the problems, address the problems and resolve them, which made me think they'd just, you know, they'd just put up a stone wall on the whole thing. Your last paragraph might be considered to be prophetic. <laughs> yeah, we've done um, it. <laughs> I, don't suppose, I don't suppose when um, you wrote it you would end up 20 years later sitting here answering my questions? No. Um, in the clip of um, materials that identified or, or led to the Sandy Stephen comprehensive review that we saw, the five paragraphs on the one page, in that clip of material is a note from um, Mike Wakeley, your retail line manager. Um, contributing to that document. And he said that at this time, Alan believes his actions are now a matter of principle. Is that how you felt? It was, because it goes back to uh, an earlier letter that they could hold me liable for any amount in there. That's what, I would, that's what they wanted me to agree to. And that was wrong. Uh, that can come down, thank you. 
I think one of the first things that you did after termination of your contract was to um, set up the website, um, the www.postofficevictims.org.uk. I did, yeah. Yes, I did. Um, and I also wrote to the local newspaper who, to explain to the local community uh, what had gone on. Unfortunately, the local paper printed my letter in full to explain what had happened with post office. I also had um, large-scale posters blown up of that letter which were attached to the front of the door of our premises and remained there for quite a time. And postofficevictims.org UK it, it was the nascent group that subsequently became the JFSA, is that right? It, 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 I suppose it was like a, a seed, I wouldn't say organisation. It, it, um, it was what I set up initially there to try and attract and, and draw uh, other cases and also as a warning to others about getting involved with post office. This is, this is the type of organisation you are um, planning to get involved with. And there were other things I did as well around that time to uh, try and raise uh, the profile of the issue. Can we turn to um, page 28 of your witness statement, please? And uh, paragraph 92. And if I <coughs> zoom in on that, please. You say, my main objective for creating the JFSA was to expose the truth. I wanted to create a body of former and current subpostmasters and branch assistants which could provide a community for all those going through the same experiences with the post office. I knew that I was not alone in my dealings with the post office, and the JFSA was set up in order to ensure that other people in the same situation as myself knew that they too were not on their own. As mentioned above, there was a complete lack of support from post office, and I believe those in sim similar circumstances required um, support. Um, I've read elsewhere that one of the reasons that um, you set up the group was that you and others had felt that you had been abandoned by every other organisation so that you had to group together, is that right? Yeah, I mean, and I, uh, I think that's true, um, what you're saying there. It was myself and others as well. It wasn't... I know I, I seem to take the lead in it, but um, there were a lot of others. Certainly in the early days, there was a great deal of support from... Which other organisations had abandoned you and others? Well, certainly the Federation. The Federation was absolutely useless. I mean, they were just another department of post office, as I believe it still is these days as well. But um, uh, they, what, they why, just, do you, why do you think they're just another department of the post office? Well, um, at one time, I believe they had an office in, in post office headquarters, but ignoring that, um, they... It depends which bit we're going. If you go right back to the early days, the 2002s, 2003s, and when I was going to these federation meetings, I know I attended one uh, meeting uh, where a sub-postmaster at the back of the uh, meeting group, he started saying, I've just had my post office taken off me, and I'd had problems with Horizon and all the rest. And the federation exec, the federation exec people who were there escorted him out the back of the place. Uh, they took him away from, out of that meeting. I know perfectly well when my contract was terminated, I went to a federation meeting to try, uh, well, a, a local branch one. I went to a federation meeting where I tried to um, speak on behalf of that. And um, there was one of the national executive uh, federation members at that meeting. And he stopped, tried to stop me speaking. He refused to say this, that uh, I should be allowed to talk about such things at the meeting. And if it hadn't been for the local chairman, who was Noel Thomas at that time, um, if it hadn't been for him talking and moving this chap out the way, I'd never been able to get over what had happened to me and explain to the other So there was an awful lot of pressure from the Federation to support post office in it. In fact, there is, I don't know if you're going to show it, there is correspondence um, from the Federation 
where they actually support post office's position in terminating my contract. Um, I don't know whether you're going to cover that. Um, slightly out of order, but I think I know what you're um, <laughs> talking about. Can we... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you're asking about the Federation. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to bowl the fastballs. <laughs> um, okay. I think, um, if I can cover drive it back, it's poll... 0215384. If you're right, that's a good slip catch. <laughs> Is that the document you're talking about? Uh, a letter to you from Colin Baker, the General Secretary of the NFSP. Yeah. Uh, you, you had written a couple of letters to him that I'm not going to show now no, no. Um, of December 2003 and January 2004 mm. and he notes that Betty Williams has written to Alan Leighton, we've seen that um, he says I can go no higher within the Royal Mail Group than Alan Leighton, I'm sure that your Member of Parliament will have had as much if not more success than I would hopefully you'll have more information from that um, route and then the last paragraph, I think, is the one you're referring to. We're not in a position to provide information regarding other sub-postmasters' dealings with post office. We're aware there are some disputes around the time that um, offices migrated from the manual system to the Horizon system. But we are now of the view that Horizon works well and there are no real problems with post offices at which are operating the, or operated by the Horizon system. Was that essentially the NFSP position as communicated to you? Horizon works well. There are no problems with post of, in post offices with it. Yeah, and I, um, it was very much... I, I mean, the Federation always seemed to try and manage any of the problems around Horizon. Um, I can recall a conference, Federation conference, main conference, I think it was in 2002, around there, in... It was in Llandidno, which is why I went to it. And there were a whole host of people raising queries, delegates raising queries about Horizon during conference. And it got to such a state that they couldn't move on with conference. And conference decided to set up a separate committee to look into uh, Horizon issues and, um, and for members to report that to them. And they would then discuss them with post office. Uh, to what extent has the NFSP assisted you in establishing the facts in your case? None. To what extent has the NFSP assisted you in seeking redress in your case? None. To your knowledge, what role did the NFSP play in assisting other sub-postmasters when it was alleged against the sub-postmaster that they had a shortfall? I have not heard of one instance where they've successfully done anything of that nature. I think you tell us that you've um, been informed that the post office would often only allow a representative of the NFSP or a friend to sit in on interviews where suspension or termination was contemplated. That's correct. And you tell us in your statement that the NFSP nearly always agreed with the post office and said sometimes to the post office, Postmaster, come on, own up, tell them what you did with the money. Yeah. Are these accounts that other sub postmasters have given to you? Yes, sir. To your knowledge, has the NFSP ever once helped a sub postmaster in any court case in which the operation of the Horizon system or the integrity of the data which it produces has been questioned? No. To what extent did the NFSP assist in the group litigation? None at all. To what extent has the NFSP assisted others following the group litigation in obtaining redress? I don't know. Thank you. If we can go back to um, where we were in the, um, the account. Uh, that can come down from the screen. Thank you. Uh, you'd set up the um, JFSA, and you tell us that from um, the late 2000s onwards, um, say from about 2009 onwards, 
you have spent an estimated 30 to 40 hours um, a week campaigning in relation to Post Office and Horizon. Is that right? Easily, yeah. Can we look, please, at page 27 of your witness statement? And paragraph 87 at the top, you say the challenges were faced at every step of the way since the post office would obstruct me. The gravity and enormity of the problem was not recognized by others in power, including government, and it became clear that the only way to achieve progress was through a formal legal route, which has its own challenges, including obtaining the necessary funding for this route. You say there that challenges were faced at every step of the way since the post office would obstruct me. What had you got in mind when you were saying that? Well, uh, <laughs> disclosure is a good one. Um, it, it, they, um, I mean, we went through, before we got to, to the court case, we went through a whole host of schemes, and they always used to say, yes, we'll be supportive, yes, we'll try, you know, with MPs and all the rest of it, yes, we'll, we'll get on board with it, yes, we're looking for the truth and all the rest of it. But all they did is, is cause problems. They, they were not forthcoming with the details in there. Certainly, disclosure is a, is a very good example of that. I mean, cases used to take months and months to progress. Um, it, I'm thinking of the in, initial mediation scheme, uh, for example. Uh, and it, you just felt, you, though they were there, you were still banging your head against a brick wall to try and get anything out of them because they were determined to protect, to protect the brand at any cost. And they didn't want anything coming out or being disclosed that might cause damage to post office. Now you ceased work as a sub-postmaster in November 20, uh, 2003. Yeah. Yes? Yes. And I think you've um, uh, not returned to other work since then because instead you've dedicated to campaigning for accountability, justice and redress, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think the key, the key issue has always been to expose the truth um, uh, uh, right from the outset um, because the other things sort of always felt f they followed on. If you, once you know the truth about issues, the rest will hopefully follow on afterwards. Um, I mean, <laughs> I didn't set out uh, to spend 20 years doing this. Um, uh, I hadn't expected to be uh, doing this so much by myself, but it it got more and more complex, and it was very it was harder and harder to share out and work as a, a bigger group um, uh, to take things forward. So, uh, yeah, I did finish up sort of leading in a way. In there. But obviously, going back to, to the others, when, when, when there was an opportunity for, for their endorsement. I, it, was, it was encouraging along the way. One, one of the things we did do is bring people together. And a, a lot of people, it was a bit like, um, I don't mean this in a derogative way, but it's a bit like stray lambs. They were lost, people were lost out there. They're the only ones. They're wandering around, wondering, you know, what have I done wrong? They're suffering so badly. But once you managed to bring them together to meet others in a similar situation, it had enormous effect on their lives. You spent um, two decades undertaking this work, um, presumably thousands of hours. <laughs> yes. Why, in your view, has that been necessary? Because the further down the road you, you went with it, um, the more you realized you couldn't let it go. I think you, um, at one stage, um, uh, attempted the um, strategy of speaking to government about this. Yeah. yeah. Can we turn, please, to correspondence with Ed Davey, MP, <laughs> in May 2010? That can come down from the screen, thank you. And so to put this into context, to orientate ourselves, May 2010, JFSA was well established now. Yeah. 
next. Yes. Uh, the Computer Weekly article had been written by Rebecca Thompson on the 11th of May 2009. Mm -hmm. And I think you were indeed interviewed by her as part of um, her work. Yes, that's correct. And her work drew together the facts about a number of cases. Yes. Can we look then at the letter that you wrote to Ed Davey, MP, on the 20th of May 2010, um, UKGI 301 6119. So um, as we can see from um, the way you've addressed the letter, um, at the top, um, Minister for Postal Affairs within the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, sometimes called um, BIS. So I think um, to put his um, position in context there, he was the then Minister for Postal a of Affairs, the new government having been formed 14 days earlier on the 6th of May, 2010. General election that year was 6th of May, so he's 14 days in. Can we read the letter together? Um, you say, I'm writing to you with regard to your position as minister on behalf of JFSA. We're an independent group of ex and serving sub-postmasters who've suffered at the hands of the post office and their horizon system ever since it was first installed. Our website uh, outlines how we came about and our aims, as well as offering sample cases that were provided by some of the group. Currently, the group numbers close to 100, though we continue to be joined by others who have learned of JFSA and have found that there is nowhere else to turn for help. In every instance, the post office acts as judge, jury, and executioner, and the individual is deserted by their reputed, uh, reputed representative organization the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters. Invariably, these cases all stem from the flows, sorry, the flaws of the Horizon system that the post office introduced and which they refuse to admit has ever suffered from a single problem. The evidence is there to be found by anyone in a position of being able to unlock doors instead of placing barriers in the way of those pursuing the information. Our organization has access to a number of specialists who could provide the questions and analyze the resulting data if required, uh, though an independent um, in external investigation instigated at ministerial level would be most appropriate uh, and will without doubt easily find evidence of the error-ridden system. I'm sure you'll appreciate that there is not a single computer system that does not from time to time suffer from errors, especially when the size and level of complexity of the programs associated with the Horizon system. The post office blindly state that there are not nor have there ever been any system errors. So subsequently, anything wrong is entirely the responsibility of the sub-postmaster, as that is what they've agreed to when signing their contract. This is a contract that was produced in 1994 and does not address nor identify new technology, but they're still using it to intimidate and prosecute sub-postmasters. Over the page, uh, the weight of evidence we've been collating over the years continues to grow and gain in standing. It's only the flat refusal of the post office to allow experts to examine the system which is holding back this major scandal from breaking. With the continuing, uh, sorry, the growing numbers in JFSA and the support we're now finding from the IT community and the media, it's just a matter of time until the real truth about the post office and horizon is exposed. Over the years, I've personally submitted written details of all of this to the select committee of the DTI and then on two other occasions to that of Burr. And put simply, the information has either been buried or disappeared. Others of JFSA, JFSA have followed the route of contacting their MPs, who've taken the matter up with the post office on their behalf. Subsequently, they're stonewalled or handled by the post office, often with off-the-shelf answers where they only change the name and address. I'm writing to you on behalf of the group. I'm asking for a meeting where we can present our case to you. Much has appeared in the press over the last few days that government is going to change, and I only hope that's true. If it is, the abuse of sub-postmasters that has been going on under the protection of the previous government may well come to an end. So your letter to um, Mr. Davy MP um, provides um, some detail, either in the body of the letter or through cross-referencing to your um, website as to the issues that sub-postmasters were facing and informs Mr. Davy 
that um, the post office's conduct amounted to a scandal? Yes. Very much. Uh, can we look at the reply, please? ABAT 701. Um, dear Alan Bates, um, thank you for your letter of the 20th of May requesting a meeting. Since 2001, when the Royal Mail, which includes Post Office Limited, was set up as a public limited company with the government as its only shareholder, government has adopted an arm's length relationship with the company uh, so that it has uh, commercial freedom to run its business operations without interference from the shareholder. The integrity of the post office system is an operational and contractual matter for the post office and not government. And whilst I do appreciate your concerns and those of Alliance members, I do not believe that a meeting would serve any <coughs> useful purpose. <coughs> you tell us in your um, witness statement that you took um, offence at the term arm's length to um, describe the role that the government played in relation to overseeing and monitoring the post office. Why? Well, it's because of the structure, wasn't it? The government was the sole shareholder. They, they were the owners, as such, of all of this. And how can, how can you run or take control or sorry, uh, take responsibility for, for a, uh, an organisation without having some interest in there or trying to be in control? In fact, government were pumping huge amounts of money into post office year after year. So, you know, they need to be held li uh, well, responsible or you know, they need to be addressed, really, about the way that they've been going on. And it's very hard to gauge them in it. Um, not nowadays. They're a bit more interested these days. But, I mean, at that time, to try and get government to, to take it uh, on board seriously is... Bit before a four-part drama on ITV. Well, no, I mean, no I mean, in fairness, yes, the drama was great. It did a lot for, for us. But, I mean, we've had an enormous cross-party support from many MPs over the years, uh, some of whom I think you'll see you know, shortly. But, I mean, um, the, you know, the time this, this letter was written was in 2010, and I think at that time we were involved with a firm called uh, Shoesmith, so a law firm called Shoesmith. And there have been a number of meetings bringing people together. And in fact, Shoesmith had been working with the MPs. So we were, we were growing a body, we were growing an interest. And a number of the other MPs were finding their own um, constituents who, who'd had problems, some postmaster problems. So it was starting to become a little more gelled as, as an organisation and the number, uh, um, with a, a, a substantial number, a growing and growing number in there. And it was very much why we felt government should have been involved at that time. I mean, you show me this letter from Ed Davy, and I... I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what your script is, but I mean, I, I'm more concerned about another letter that came in response from uh, a letter I wrote to Ed Davey, and um, I'm not sure whether you're going to go to that. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. You tell us in your witness statement, I'm not going to turn it up, um, it's paragraph 104, okay. um, that this response from um, Mr Davey was disappointing because he had not taken account of anything which you had said in your letter and indeed appeared to be a standard template form of response. Is that correct? Yes. And I think you didn't keep those feelings to yourself at the time. Uh, you, in fact, sent a reply to Mr Davey um, on the 8th of July 2010. Can we please look at UKGI 3016099? You say, um, I have to say that your response to me, dated the 31st of May, that's one we've just looked at, regarding the very serious, very serious issues I had uh, raised was not only disappointing, but I actually found your comments offensive. It seems, though, that um, there are new politicians in post. The government hasn't changed. The letter you sent is little different to the one I received seven years ago from the minister responsible for post offices at that time. 
and so many more lives have been ruined in the interim um, because of that same attitude. It's not that you can't get involved or cannot investigate the matter. After all, you do own 100% of the shares, and normally shareholders are concerned about the morality of the business they own. It's because you've adopted an arm length relationship that you have allowed a once great institution to be asset stripped by little more than thugs in suits, and you've enabled them to carry on with impunity regardless of the human misery and suffering they inflict. You can listen to your civil servants telling you that these are really an operational matter for the post office to deal with. You can even listen to the post office telling you Horizon is wonderful, that there's never um, ever been a problem. It is inherently robust, and these are just a few malcontents trying to cause trouble. Or you can meet and hear us, sorry, you can meet with us and hear the real truth behind Horizon and what the post office is actually up to. Your civil servants and the post office will not tell you about post office staff harassing sick ex-sub-postmasters demanding written promises of money or they'll send the police around. They won't tell you that the post office watches post offices, heading into trouble, fails to provide any help and then waits until the problem shows a loss of £20,000 plus so that the sub-postmaster then falls foul of the Proceeds of Crime Act. They won't tell you that when someone wants to sell their post office and has a suitable buyer, post office will turn down the applicant to drive that business into the ground. You won't hear about sub-postmasters endingly requesting audits of their offices and having to wait for up to um, five years for someone to turn up in offices turning over five million pounds a year. Neither will they tell you of the cases where the post office have run an audit, closed the post office, bankrupting the owner who loses his business, house and family, holds a pending court case over him for 18 months, then drops the charges and walks away. Nor will they tell you um, tell all about how they are stopping sub-postmasters selling on the post office uh, side of their business in order to recover the original investment. They won't even tell you the post office, sorry, that the Horizon system is designed to entrap sub-postmasters so that they can easily finish up in prison just by trying to open up the day after a trading uh, period balance. This is just a taste of some of the practices your company is carrying out in your name day after day. They brandish a big legal stick, fail to provide evidence in court, and rely on the clause in the 1994 contract about a sub-postmaster being liable for any loss from their office, however it occurs. Yet their shoddy horizon system is the root cause of all of this. Post office themselves lose thousands of pounds from each of the crown offices that they run using horizon, though their staff are not treated as guilty and too proven innocent, but a sub-postmaster is. The whole of this scandal is teetering on the edge of a precipice at this point, but it's still not too late for you to reconsider convening a meeting to discuss this issue involved if you're prepared to keep an open mind. It seems that um, following your letter, um, Mr. Davy agreed to a meeting. Yes. Um, at um, paragraph 105 of your witness statement, there's no need to turn it up, you confirm that you attended a meeting with um, Mr. Davey on or about the 7th of October. Um, and you tell us that you don't, in fact, have a note of the meeting and can't recall details of the um, meeting. The inquiry is in possession of a briefing document for Mr. Davey for the purposes of um, his attendance at that meeting um, with you. Um, can we uh, see whether we can look at that, please? UKGI 6062. It's dated, as you'll see, the 5th of October 2010. And the um, purpose of the document is a rescheduled meeting with you on the 7th of October to discuss the JFSA's claims that endemic flaws in the Horizon system have resulted in a number of sub-postmasters having their contracts wrongly terminated um, and in many cases prosecuted for uh, false accounting. And if we scroll down, please. It sets out the uh, background to the meeting, recalling the history of your two letters, describing the second as being more confrontational And then it says that, this is the 
fourth line of that paragraph, uh, that letter was followed by reports that Channel 4 were planning to run a news item on the JFSA campaign. Uh, we then recommended offering a meeting in response to this second request, that's the letter we've just read, quote, for presentational reasons against the background of potential publicity playing heavily on government minister, quote, refusing to meet victims of government-owned post office horizon system, which has systemic faults resulting in wrongful accusations of theft and false accounting, end um, quote. So this records that the recommendation to Mr. Davey was that he should offer to attend a meeting for presentational reasons against the background of potential publicity, i.e. the Channel 4 uh, news item. When you um, attended the meeting, can you recall whether Mr. Davey appeared to engage with the substance of the issues that you were raising? I don't recall. You don't recall whether he did or mm. not? No, I, or I, I, I don't... don't I don't recall the, 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 the detail of, of the meeting, and I'm quite certain that if there had been something positive that was coming out of it, I'd have re remembered that. If we scroll on on the briefing note for Mr. Davis, uh, sorry, Mr. Davey, um, it sets out the objectives. Uh, he's to seek to establish at a very early stage whether legal action against post office is imminent or planned, and it would be prudent to adopt a sub judice approach in the comments you make. He should emphasize the issues raised by the JFSA are operational and contractual matters. Should make the point about um, government having an arm's length relationship. Establish whether the JFSA is committed or planning to initiate action against the post office. Uh, note that it will be for the relevant legal process to decide on the JFA case. Demonstrate you're prepared to hear the JFSA's side of the story, but make it clear you're not in a position to offer substantive comment and avoid committing to setting up an independent or external um, review of Horizon. Do you recall whether Mr. Davey responded to the points that you had made in detail in your letter of the 8th of July? No, I don't recall. Sorry. To your mind, was Mr. Davey aware at the conclusion of your meeting that a scandal, in your view, had taken place and was in the process of still taking place? I'm, I'm, I don't recall. Did Mr. Davey um, alter the position that he had set out in the letter? that the government enjoyed an arm's length um, relationship with the post office in the light of the concerns that you had raised? I don't know. What was the outcome of the meeting? Uh, <laughs> um, I can't think of anything startling that came out of it, otherwise I'd probably recall it. But um, I, I suppose... I mean, this has been like a long journey. You, you sort of... You, <laughs> you, you finish one thing, you move on to the next. Been there, done that, tried that, so let's just keep going. Um, so I think it was just uh, another step along the way. Did you walk away from the meeting with Mr Davey having said that he was going to do anything at all? Not that I can recall, which I ha can recall from other ministers I've met. Are you able to remember any positive development arising from the meeting? No. Nope. Thank you, that can come down. Uh, looking at the way that the um, Horizon scandal developed, uh, what view do you take of the arm's length approach that the government took in relation to its oversight of the post office? I think it should have been involved or got involved far earlier on. And in fact, um, <laughs> I don't want to preempt where you're going, but uh, I, there was a, a I think one of the responses I think I got from Ed Davies' office at a later time, which, oh no, it might have been a different minister. I'm sorry, I may be jumping the gun. It was, it was a, a response that I'd written to one of the ministers for a meeting, but the, the, and to inform them that four letters of intent had been issued 
by the lawyers, Shoesmiths at that time. But the response didn't come from the minister. It came from the shareholder executive, i.e. government. Um, so they were fully aware that legal proceedings were potentially about to begin. Throughout your statement, you refer to the responses of government ministers across the years. Um, Pat McFadden, um, Ed Davey, Norman Lamb, Joe Swinson, and others uh, on being repeatedly informed about the um, concerns of sub-postmasters and Crown Office employees, the formation of the JFSA, and indeed the GLO, in which they say that the post office is an arm's length body, that the matters raised were matters for the post office to deal with, and that the post office was independent of government. I'm, I'm, I do think a lot of the ministers, uh, uh, a lot of them come in for a stick in the inquiry and all the rest of it, and uh, I'm sure some of it's deserved, but I actually hold the department um, and I, I, I hold the civil service more to blame in a lot of these instances why things never progressed at the time. Because I'm sure between them and post office briefing ministers, they were briefing them in the direction they wanted to, uh, to brief them in. Not that it was for the benefit of the group or the individuals in there, because of the positions that they felt they were in and that should be taken at that time. And also knowing that they probably have other organizations um, hammering away or uh, nagging at them, but they were going to probably wait and see who got they're the furthest, who got the furthest. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I do think it's, I do certainly hold the officials far more guilty in all of this than the, the politicians. You tell us, um, finally, before lunch, um, in paragraph 298 of your witness statement, yeah. that around this point, the point being after the settlement of the group litigation, yeah. the government abandoned the line that this was all a matter for the post office and moved on to the new line that it had been misled by the post office. Is that your view? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they could deny anything else, could they, really? Thank you very much, Mr um, Bates. Uh, um, if that's an appropriate moment, can I ask that, I think it's five past now, can we um, uh, reconvene at five two? Yeah. So five to two. Please. Five to two, everyone, yeah. <laughs>
Uh, good afternoon, uh, sir. I think we're about to start, if we may, please. Uh, Mr. Bates, we left off um, <coughs> before lunch by looking at correspondence with Ed Davey. Can I turn to um, Mr. Davey's successor, Norman Lamb MP? And on the 25th of February 2012, you wrote to him. Can we look at that letter, please? Poll 00107331. Thank you. I think uh, from public records that. Um, just, just hang on a second. I left my glasses in my. I think from public records, uh, it's the case that Mr. Lamb had taken over as Minister for Postal Affairs on the 3rd of February 2012, um, Mr. Davy having been promoted to become Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. And so you were here writing, um, again, shortly after a change in post, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, if we look at the letter, you say you're writing on behalf of the JSFA as you did with the former minister. Uh, on that and uh, subsequent occasions, I wrote to draw attention, his attention to the plight of sub-postmasters at the hand of Post Office Limited. Um, the reference number was given, and it will provide an outline of our concerns. During November 2010, um, I met him at his um, office. Um, I think that was October 2010, um, uh, to raise many of the issues which have been causing devastation and distress in the sub-postmaster community. Following the meeting, I understand he queried a number of points with post office management, and he seems to have taken them at their uh, word. On what was that based? Can you recall that following the meeting, you understood that Mr. Davy had queried a number of points with post office management, and he seems to have taken them at their word? Well, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Um, I write to you on this occasion to request a meeting to discuss this matter further with you. As you'll see from previous correspondence, solicitors are now acting on behalf of a number of um, victims of Post Office Limited, but the law moves slowly, and in the meantime, many more sub-postmasters will suffer. Whilst JSFA very much reflects the views of those who have fallen victims to the failures of Post Office Limited's Horizon system, I want to draw your attention to the enclosed survey which has just taken place. As you'll see, it's been completed by serving sub-postmasters with their anonymity ensured to safeguard them from reprisals. I'm sure you'll find the results disturbing and in total conflict with the assurances given by Post Office Limited to your predecessor and no doubt to yourself if you were to raise our concerns with them. Um, who conducted the survey? Uh, well, I did, really, um, via the website. We, I think we only had it up for about a week. It was a very short, sharp um, uh, survey just to get some sort of feedback from sub-postmasters of what extent things happened before people started to abuse the, um, the uh, uh, survey. And I think on the subsequent pages, if we just quickly look at them in the interest of time, um, uh, we look at page three. You tell us in the second paragraph the survey remained online for eight days. Yeah. It was a survey, monkey-led um, uh, uh, survey. And then over the page to page five. Some examples, I'm not going to go through all of this. Do you have regular balance shortages that you have to put money into address? 77% uh, of respondents said yes. Yeah. Uh, going back to page one of the letter, please. And the last paragraph, uh, or penultimate paragraph. Previously, we offered to work with your department to assist with uncovering this major scandal. And I now extend that offer to you. Um, you got a reply to this letter, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Can we look at that? UKGI treble zero one six double one two. And if we just blow up the main text from Norman Lamb, um, 
I think you'd followed it up in the meantime with a chaser on the 20th of March, which is why it refers in the first paragraph to letters of 25th of February, which is the one we've looked at, and 20th of March, which we haven't. Uh, he apologises for the delay in replying. And he says, as you're aware from your contacts with my uh, predecessor, Ed Davey, the concerns raised by the GFSA rate to operational and contractual matters for the post office. And as the shareholder, government has an arm's length relationship with the company and um, uh, does not, I think that should say, does not have any role in its day-to-day -day operations. I also understand that legal action against post office is underway uh, on behalf, I think that should say, of a number of GFSA uh, members. Uh, taking into account that any meeting would take place within this overall context, I would ask you to contact my diary manager to, um, uh, if you'd still like to arrange a suitable date. So um, uh, taking the point about an arm's length relationship, meaning that government has no role in operational and contractual matters, but nonetheless offering um, a meeting. You, um, I think, uh, know that you attended a, um, the meeting that's referred to in that um, paragraph, although you can't recall the date. You say it was mid-2012. Um, we know from other evidence that it was on the 27th of June 2012, so you're um, exactly right. And you tell us in your statement, that letter can come down, thank you, um, that Mr Lamb appeared to be willing to listen to you. Yeah, it's the first time I, I thought a minister was actually taking on board the concerns that we were raising with him. Um, and he, he did seem to be genuinely concerned about it. Uh, did you form the impression at the meeting uh, with Mr Lamb that he understood that, that um, a scandal had developed? I think, I, I think he was starting to recognise there was a real problem. Did you form any view as to whether or not Mr Lamb was going to continue to rely on the justification that the government had an arm's length relationship with the post office? I, I don't think that's the way his support, if, he, if it was support for, for our uh, cause, went. Um, I think it probably manifested itself in, in a different way, but I, I could be wrong on that. It's um, fair to point out that um, this meeting on the 27th of June 2012 um, ought to be viewed in the context of some other developments that yeah. had taken place in the meantime. Yeah. Um, if we can just reference those without going into the details, um, there had been meetings with James Arbuthnot um, and Oliver Letwin. Yeah. Um, a small group of MPs had joined and had met with senior post office um, management and on the 18th of June 2012, they had agreed to commission an independent review. Yeah. Did you know those things at the time of the meeting with Mr. Lamb? Um, I was aware of what was going on there, and I think I, I, I could be wrong. This is my reading of the situation. I would not be surprised at all whether um, this is what I'm saying that Norman Lamb perhaps showed his support somewhat differently maybe putting uh, a quiet word with post office that maybe they should support some sort of MP or whatever investigation. That was my impression. I could be wrong. It's just that the timing seemed to work quite well. Everything seemed to slot into place there. Um, after Norman Lamb was um, replaced, he was in office for, um, in this office for a, a short period of time, six months or so. Yeah. Um, did you um, pursue the matter immediately with his successor? I don't recall. Uh, I think we were following another route at that time, weren't we? Were Are you the second site? Yeah, that's right. Um, review. Mm. <coughs> Can we turn then to the appointment of second site? Um, we know from your written evidence and some uh, the documents that we've got mm. how it was that the idea of an independent review came to be conceived and carried into effect and that um, Second Sight were to be appointed in order to conduct the investigation or the review. How did you first feel when it was suggested that Second Sight be brought in to undertake an investigation or a review? We're talking now of the MP case review. Yes. Uh, um, 
Suspicious. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, we were highly suspicious of it because were they being brought in to, if you like, whitewash the, <coughs> it on behalf of post office because um, post office brought them forward um, to, to ourselves to, um, to, to see how we, we thought uh, they would get on. But, I mean, as time went on with Second Sight, we had more and more confidence in, in their independence in it. But initially... Um, we, we were highly wary of them. And was that because they were being paid for? Yeah, uh, in a lot by, of these, by the post office. By post office, yeah. I mean, um, and that's been a concern down the line with all the different schemes that the um, post office has been funding them. Um, and it, I've always said, and I, and I continue to say now, is throughout the whole of the period, with all of this, all of this sort of scandal that's been going on. It's, it's been about control of the narrative, and it's something that post office was incredibly keen to do. They had the money, they had the powers, they, had, they wanted to brief the MPs, they wanted to do X, Y, and Z, they wanted to sit on the committees of all of these things, they wanted to pay for everything in there. And it was, um, it, it always has been the, the concern, um, this controlling the narrative. I mean, I think they lost that at the time we, went, we got to the GLO, or just after the GLO. But, I mean, uh, up until then, um, they, they, I think it was their approach to managing the whole of this situation. Looking at the work of Second Sight as a whole, mm. and in particular the post office's approach to it, mm. did you form a view on the basis of what the post office said and what the post office did well, I could have lost as to whether the post office um, <laughs> wanted the investigation to succeed, uh, to engage openly and transparently with it, and for the truth to emerge. I don't know. They, 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 used, to, <laughs> they used to say at the meetings that they wanted the truth as well. But, um, I, I mean, I had a lot of faith in James Arbuthnot, who was like the lead MP supporter for us. And... Um, I think, actually, as it quotes in the drama, what, what other choice did we have at that time as well? And it seemed a, 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 um, a way of taking it forward, at least people starting to investigate and look seriously at these cases. And, uh, you know, let's see, how it got, let's see how it went. Let's see how it got on, yeah. You said that, you, um, what other choice did we have? Yeah. Why did you feel that you had no other choice? Well, we, we, we had no money. We... Um, the legal option wasn't available to us at that time. There seemed a willingness, there seemed a, um, by post office, albeit it might have been a reluctant willingness, but there did seem uh, to be a willingness by post office at that time. And, I mean, the, the, the MPs were, were quite positive about it at that time. Obviously wary, but they were quite positive. So it, it, it did seem a good way forward, at least to start with. Uh, can I just briefly explore the um, extent of the JFSA and your involvement in the appointment of um, Second Sight? You tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph 109, mm. that you and the JFSA were not involved in the appointment of Second Sight, albeit MPs were keen to seek your approval of Second Sight's appointment. Can we look at a few documents, please, on that? Uh, starting with poll 0010-7174. Um, we can see that um, if we scroll down a little bit, just to get the email up a little bit more, thank you, an email from Ron Warmington off Second Sight to Susan Crichton, Simon Baker, and copying in his colleague um, Ian Henderson on the 4th of July. And it's a report of a meeting that day with MPs. Um, and it says in the second paragraph, as well as James and Janet, that's James Arbuthnot and Janet Walker, is that right? Correct. His chief of staff. Yes. Um, there were the following, and there were four MPs set out, um, and a representative of Andrew Garnier. Um, Oliver Leptwin sent his apologies. Um, and then just scrolling down a bit, thank you, uh, about halfway down the page... Um, J.A., that's James Arbuthnot, stated it was a pity that having cleared it that the JFSA leader, Alan Bates, could attend. In the end, he was unable to do so. 
um, at short notice. So it, it's right, is it, that you were invited to attend the meeting with MPs to discuss whether second site should be appointed? Yes. And then um, JA clearly wanted to and now wants to get some buy-in from Alan Bates and seemed genuinely disappointed that the whole thing couldn't be buttoned up today. He asked whether Ron Warmington would be prepared to come back for a three-person meeting in James Arbuthnot's office. Uh, Ron Warmington, um, of course, offered to do that. And then if we go to page three, please. And if we scroll down a little bit, yeah, it's just um, three paragraphs on the bottom. In regard to Alan Bates and the JFSA, whilst James Arbuthnot clearly wants Alan Bates's buy-in, he doesn't want to give Alan Bates the impression that he, Alan Bates, has a power of veto over who carries out the review, its scope and how it is to be um, carried out. Uh, the meeting concluded with James Arbuthnot confirming on behalf of all present that they're satisfied that second sight is a suitable choice and it now remains to get Alan Bates and GFSA um, concurrence. So it seems that, um, would you agree, that the MPs wanted your approval on behalf of the GFSA in order to, as it's put, button up second site's appointment? Yes. And would you agree that it, it wasn't therefore necessarily a done deal, the appointment of second site, without your approval? No, but I don't think um, we were going to be able to hold them sort of hostage over it as well. I think they'd have gone on there without it, but obviously they prefer to have our blessing. And I think you therefore attended a meeting um, with Kayla Nell and Second Sight. That's right. Um, uh, can we look at that, please? Poll 3096817. And um, at the um, page two, at the foot of it, please. An email from uh, James Arbuthnot to Paula Venels. I've just completed a very good meeting with Ron and Ian from Second Sight um, and you. Uh, you were accompanied by a forensic accountant, Kay Linnell. Both asked some uh, challenging questions of Ron and Ian, which they answered to Mr. Bates and Miss Linnell's um, uh, satisfaction. Um, do, do you recall um, attending that meeting and coming away with it having expressed satisfaction that Second Sight were suitable appointees? Yes, I think so, yeah. And therefore, you essentially agreed to their appointment? Oh, yes. And so to that extent, um, it, would you accept that you and the JFSA were um, both, therefore, involved in the appointment of Second Sight? To that extent, yes. Uh, can we turn to Second, type, second Sight's remit, please? You tell us in paragraph 111 of your statement that you don't recall being involved in setting second sites remit or terms of reference. Again, can we look at a, a certain um, documents in relation to that? Uh, poll 00143976. Poll 00143976. And if we look at the email at the bottom of the page, from Simon Baker to you on the 14th of November, Mr. Baker, the head of business change, saying he works for the post office and involved is involved in setting supporting the second site investigation. Uh, following on from your conversation with Paula Venels and James R. Buthnot, we've updated your draft immunity agreement so that it addresses both your concerns. This is a draft document. Uh, please call me once you've had a chance to review. Um, we'll also send a copy to Kay Linnell to ensure she's kept in the um, picture. What was the um, immunity agreement about, please? I don't clearly recall, but I, I know there was um, 
We had concerns about anyone coming forward to, to any of the schemes there, that there might be some sort of uh, well, post office and may well, um, uh, I don't know. The, there might be some sort of retribution by post office for anyone. And, I, and I, what we wanted was some sort of agreement that such an instance wouldn't happen in there. And I think that um, hopefully, I, I'm pretty certain they did approve something in the end as well. Can we look please at the document that was attached to that email, the Raising Concerns with Horizon document, at poll 00143977? Uh, the draft document says, um, uh, this is a paper that's been issued by the agreement of Post Office Limited and the Justice for Sub-Postmasters um, Alliance. Is it right that um, it was intended that the raising concerns with Horizon document, which was a foundational document for this part of the review, was to be a, a, a document that was issued with the agreement of both Post Office and JFSA? Well, we, yeah, we, we wanted to uh, agree the wording of it and it encompassed uh, all, all the issues involved. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's quite an interesting document um, with some of the, the comments that are in it um, nowadays. Uh, um, <laughs> I, can, can I take you to the things that I found yeah, interesting sorry, and, yeah. and then it, you add if there are okay. any others. Um, I was looking at page four of the document under the heading, the remit of the inquiry. Okay, yeah. um, the remit of the inquiry will be to consider and advise on whether there are any systemic issues um, and or concerns with the Horizon system, including training and support processes, giving evidence and reasons for the conclusion reached. Um, inquiry is not asked to investigate or comment on general improvements which might be made. It's not a mediation or arbitration. Um, the terms of reference there, do they set out, sorry, do the, does the remit described there essentially set out the terms of reference? I think it does. Um, I mean, it was <clears throat> early days for us as a group to be involved with this type of scheme. Um, so um, we were a little bit led by what was thought in there, but we, we felt it encompassed the main concerns at an early stage. Yeah. And, and here the remit is said to uh, consider and advise on whether there are systemic issues or concerns with the whole system. Yeah. Was that um, JFSA's aim? Well, it's, it was to try and establish the truth about it, yeah. Is that how it ended up? Well, I think um, there was a um, slight disagreement over the word systemic issues and how far they extended and all, all that issue. But yeah, basically, that's where it started from. Uh, can we move... Um, sorry, was there anything else in here that you wanted to draw attention to? Well, on that document? Yes. Well, um, uh, it was on page one of the original document. We've gone on to the appendix, so haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't do this, but um, it, it was some of the wording in there. We, we all recognise, so it's a third paragraph, we all recognise that Post Office Limited cares about its agents and thousands of um, uh, sub postmasters. Post Office Limited to committing the highest standards of corporate openness, pr um, probity, and accountability is happy to sensibly challenge and believe that. I can't see the next bit. Sorry. Um, can I see the next, the full page, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, it, it, was, it was this statement underneath. Post Office Limited would like to take this opportunity to emphasize that these fears are unfounded. Um, I mean, and they've been going on about, uh, sorry, it's the top paragraph or the second paragraph down, where there's been persistent uh, assertions that the Horizon system, Horizon, may be the source of unresolved shortages in post office. 
and then they're trying to dismiss it afterwards. It's just that I think that's quite important for what was known by post office at that time, and they were quite happy to put their name to a statement like that. That's Sorry, that was just the point on that. Th th thank you, Mr Bates. Now, I think you um, sent a reply to um, this request for comments on the draft yeah. to um, Simon Baker. I'm not going to turn it up, but the reference is poll 00183679. Uh, that was on the 20th of November 2012. Mm. And um, your only major change was to extend the deadline for concerns to be lodged until the 31st of March 2013, I think. So I think it's fair to say that um, looking at that exchange of emails and the drafts attached, mm -hmm. that you, on behalf of JFSA, had agreed the, the remit of um, the initial second site investigation. I think we'd agreed with the remit, yes. I'm sorry, I missed that. I think we agreed with the remit. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that can come down. Can we um, turn to your witness statement, please? Um, page 35. And in um, paragraph 110, you say something similar to uh, that which you've said already today. Uh, we had real concerns as they, that second site, had been chosen by the post office. We were concerned as to whether they would undertake a whitewash and were in the post office's pocket in a similar way to the NFSP. And then paragraph 112. I was suspicious of the post office at this point and the whole scheme in general after having engaged in countless communications with the post office over a long period of time, all of which were sent in the hope of receiving some support from the post office. Uh, no one felt as if we could trust the post office in all of this. I think it's right that despite your initial suspicions, your impression of second sight improved yeah. um, once you had had direct engagement with them, is that right? Yes. We can see that by looking at page 37 of your witness statement. At paragraph 118 at the foot of the page. My impression of second sight improved from um, initial contact with them. I felt more confident in their ability and could see them operating more independently from the post office. My main reservation at the start had been the fact they had been selected by the post office. However, I came to see that they were keen on um, working as an unbiased third party, which improved my confidence in them as an investigating body. Was that as a result of your direct engagement with Second Side? Yeah. No, um, <clears throat> I did used to spend quite a bit of time, certainly in the early days as well, providing background information to how, th how things had come about. And also um, contact information about uh, individuals or uh, any queries about those in the group as well. I think you had a concern, nonetheless, that information was um, not getting back to uh, Paula Venels on the post office side, is that right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. You tell us about that in um, paragraph 123 of your witness statement on page 39. You say there was a concern that perhaps the information was not getting through to Ms Venels, as I did not think her staff were feeding back to her. I was concerned she wasn't being told the full story, so I wanted to ensure she was being accurately informed of the whole situation. This was perhaps a failure in the way Ms. Venels handled the situation in that I did not feel confident that she had been receiving accurate updates and was truly invested in the investigation and the subsequent events. Um, and we're going to explore um, with um, other witnesses, including Ms. Venels, yeah. um, and including, of course, by reference to recordings of conversations that the inquiry is in possession of the extent to which he was not or was not being properly briefed and was um, challenging of the information that she received. But can we look at a direct communication to, yeah. you, to, to you, uh, between the pair of you? 
It's poll 3098418. And look at the email at the foot of the page, please. Thank you. Um, so this is 21st of May um, 2013, and um, you copy um, Kayla Nell in, <coughs> and it's a direct email to Paula Venels. You say, hello, Paula. It's been a while since we met at James R. Buthnot's um, office, but at that time, uh, you did say, if I had any concerns, I should contact you directly, hence the reason for this email. Would it be possible for Kayla Nell and I to meet you? You'll recall that Kay is an independent forensic accountant on behalf who on behalf of JFSA has been monitoring the work Second Sight has been undertaking. The main purpose of the meeting is to ensure you've been receiving the full details of what have been occurring with the Second Sight investigation, bearing in mind what's been discovered so far. I, uh, for one, am surprised that we haven't met, yet met to discuss the implications. Whilst I appreciate the majority of the issues began under previous regimes and you've expressed a genuine willingness to address the concerns that JFSA have been raising, that these issues are still continuing. I've little doubt it's now um, feasible to show that many of the prosecutions that the post office have pressed home should never have taken place. I believe this is a view shared by Kay. And then you suggest um, some uh, dates. Overall, what was the purpose of making such direct one-to-one -one contact with Paula Venels? I don't remember clearly at that particular time for, for that particular <coughs> issue, but um, <clears throat> I certainly, uh, I, I can't, we, we obviously did have concerns at that point about what was going on and what was being reported back, but I can't actually place exactly where it lies in every In the chronology. Instance. Yeah. Uh, just um, trying a little harder on some of the details in the, yeah. um, the email. You say, bearing in mind what's been discovered so far, I'm for one surprise we haven't yet met to discuss the implications. Uh, do you know what that refers to? I'm just wondering whether that's um, after the interim report had been produced. Interim report hasn't come out yet. Hasn't come yet. Um, that's not until the 8th of July 2013. Okay, that's a bit I late. think this must be early emerging information from Second Sight. I wonder if it was a draft of it. Um, I don't think a draft had emerged by the 21st of May. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't say. I can't, actually, I can't recall clearly the, the instances. There. Perhaps Kay can. Can you remember what happened as a result of this? It... Depends where it drops into the chronology of the other issues, unfortunately, and uh, I don't clearly remember off the top of my head. No. Um, if we look at the top of the page, we can see that um, Miss Venel's um, assistant um, oh, well. asks Alwyn, Alwyn Lyons, the then company secretary, yeah. to draft some words. Uh, can you recall whether this resulted in a meeting? We did have a meeting with her, and also, I'm not sure whether Paula was also there at that meeting, but I, um, I do remember a meeting in Old Street. <coughs> the reason why I'm asking these questions in particular yeah. is that one of the covert recordings that we have is from the 22nd of May, uh -huh. 2013, which is the day after uh, you sent an email to Paula Venels. Um, and in that covert recording, there is a discussion over the extent to which Paula, Paula should or should not be told certain things. Certain items, right. Sorry, I can't help you further. Okay, if you can't remember, um, I'll move yeah. on. To what extent did you understand, so that document can come down, thank you, that um, at the time of the second site, the MP cases investigation, mm -hmm. as you called it, um, Fujitsu was involved in the process? I wasn't aware of anything at that time, um, not as far as the discussions that were going on about the system and all the rest of it. I had no idea of them being involved. D did you know whether the post office was going back to Fujitsu to um, uh, check or verify uh, I think information I think being given? 
I think I've seen a later document more recently, which um, um, does seem to suggest that, that uh, Fujitsu were involved and in part of discussions with post office on the system. Although this will be a question for um, second sight in due course, what was your understanding of the extent to which underlying data and information held by Fujitsu, including ARQ data, for example, um, contractual relationships between post office and Fujitsu, uh, policies and correspondence between the two organisations was obtained and analysed as part of Second Sight's work? Um, it, <laughs> it depends on what date you're saying about my, that I did become aware of it at some point that, um, but I think this was probably during the mediation scheme itself when um, we became aware that um, I think it was something like 700 requests a year could be made by post office for ARQ data from Fujitsu um, without any other charge being inflicted. But then after that, I think there was a charge involved. It, but I think that was during, as I say, during the time of the mediation scheme itself. Um, can I um, fast forward to um, after the um, draft of the Second Sight interim report was being circulated and um, look at poll 00115961. Um, this is an email from Paula Venels um, internally to a, a whole group of people within the post office. And so not something you will have seen at the time. Um, if we um, look at the first paragraph, she says that she's had two very uh, constructive uh, telephone conversations with you, which confirmed your willingness to work collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with the post office in taking forward our response to the review. In particular, he agreed to participate in a new user forum to provide feedback on training and support issues uh, related to Horizon and bring the existing review process to a conclusion. I is that right? Can you remember whether um, um, you <coughs> gave such a I, I commitment? Did, I, did have a, uh, um, I did have some uh, telephone conversations with Paula and... Um, I do remember one, quite long one, really. It was about, but it was after the the um, after the interim report had been published. That that's the one I really do recall. That that phone call. The others, I'm afraid, I don't recall. Um, she says it's worth emphasising that your main issue is not the computer, but the human aspect. How, in his view. Post Office fell to support and help vulnerable and muddle-headed sub-postmasters. Was that your view? Well, it wasn't just the computer, but it was also the way that... I mean, she's put it down as not the computer, but I'd say it definitely was the computer in there as well. But it, it's also the way that Post Office dealt with these sorts of problems and dealt with sub-postmasters in an unconstructive way. I mean, and... and I think that was one of the big problems, and that we'll probably get to it, but uh, uh, something further on, but I'll wait for that. Um. Can we turn to the next bullet point, please? Um, he, that's you, also raised the idea of setting up a new independent third party that sub-postmasters can approach if they're facing issues with Horizon, which cannot be resolved through the normal post office processes. Yeah. And she said that aligns with some of their own thinking and they're therefore inclined to agree with the idea. Uh, does that accurately reflect what you were suggesting? Yes, it does. I mean, I've, I've long felt um, that there should be a totally independent third party that sub-postmasters to go to when they have problems and um, that who could then request post office records to check things in there. I mean, it, it's an alternative scheme in there so as not to expose... Um, sub postmasters to to the uh, wrath of post office straight off, uh, and one of the reasons I, I, I used to suggest something like that was because I was being contacted over the years by a number of sub postmasters who had 
serious losses, I'm talking about 30, 40,000 pounds of losses, which they'd never declared to post office because they were so terrified of what was going to happen to them. And they didn't know what to do or how to move on from that position. And I could see something like a third party that they could have gone to directly that might have been able to assist or direct their, their, uh, their concerns might have uh, been useful. And if we just go lastly over the page, please. Uh, the last bullet point. In terms of the report itself, we received a full draft from Second Sight yesterday. This was Saturday the 6th of July, so that would have been on the Friday the 5th. And we've sent them back a version with track changes on a number of sections, which we and Fujitsu believe are either factually inaccurate or open to misinterpretation. Again, did you know at this time that uh, Fujitsu were working with the post office to provide answers to concerns raised during the second site investigation process? Not at this time. Did you at this stage ever have an opportunity to meet with Fujitsu senior managers and any technical specialists within Fujitsu to um, discuss directly your concerns? No, it was never an offer made. And <clears throat> um, post office you always used to take the position that we were contracted to them to post office um, and um, Fujitsu was a third party if you like um, contracted to, or to post office so we weren't directly um, contracted to, to uh, Fujitsu or had control over anything that went on there unfortunately and so the uh Report the second sight interim report is published um, on the 8th of July 2013. Um, if we turn up page 41 of your witness statement, please. At paragraph 128, you say, I'm not sure how many of the group, um, that, that's the JFSA, saw the report or whether it was discussed. Overall, the interim report was positive in general as it showed that there were issues concerning, uh, sorry, occurring. But we had a real concern over the interim report stating there were no systemic flaws. What was your concern about the report stating that there were no systemic flaws? Well, um, I, I actually thought there were, there were systemic flaws in there, and the systemic flaws in the way that post office operated and the way it dealt with people and all the rest of it, perhaps not um, being interpreted, interpreted in the way that there were with the computer system, even though there were uh, flaws of that nature in there. But I knew perfectly well that out of a 30-odd page report, the post office would jump on one particular line or one particular comment, and that's what would be appearing in the media and in their press releases. And it was that. To, to what extent did they deploy that line? And they did. Yeah. And they basically they kept saying that the second size you know, uh, independent um, investigators found that the, there were no systemic flaws in Horizon. You know, they just kept on picking that one line out of a 30-odd page report, which identified many other concerns right across the whole of the uh, issue. And um, did it take until the judgments of Mr Justice Fraser for anyone in a decision-making role mm. to acknowledge the existence or find uh, the existence of systemic faults and failures in the Horizon system? Well, we're, 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 we're going back now to um, controlling the narrative, and that was the first time post office lost control of the narrative once we got into the High Court. So yes, that's when the, the truth started to come out at that point. Had you previously i.e. months before then, uh, i.e. months before the 8th of July publication, mm. drawn attention um, to the problems with using the phrase um, systemic flaws, systemic failures or systemic faults to second sight? Yes. Uh, can we look, please, to poll 
Bottom email, please. Thank you. Um, this is two months before publication time, so the 12th of May, where you write to um, Ron Warmington of Second Sight, um, and there's a whole heading, um, System Errors versus Systemic Failures. Um, you point out, I'm not going to go through exactly what you say um, here in the interest of time, because we've still got a lot of ground to cover, but in short order, what was your point? Well, uh, one of the points was that I've just made to you there, that post office would jump on it as being the system, uh, and no systemic failures um, with the post office and their horizon system, which it says in there. I mean, there were system failures in there, but I just, I couldn't understand why they felt that was so important to put in something of that sort in there when it was, it was obvious that there were sy systemic failures in the way post office dealt with sub postmasters and the way they processed things and the support they gave. It, it was a total failure of post office throughout all of that. Um, and I just found it a bit frustrating. And I think even to this day, Ron will remember this in great detail. And we had a lot of um, discussions over it at the time. And I think he feels that they got it wrong. The one thing they got wrong in that report was that. Thank you, that can come down, thank you. So the um, report, um, the interim report is published on the 8th of July, yeah. um, 2013. Did you know at the time that shortly after the publication of Second Sight's interim report on the 8th of July, um, that the post office was informed that a witness that it had used in a series of prosecutions, um, Gareth Jenkins, had failed to disclose to the court material which undermined the opinions that he gave, that he had not complied with his duties to the court, that his credibility to an expert, as an expert witness was fatally undermined, that the post office had been in breach of its duties as a prosecutor, and that there were a number of convicted sub-postmasters to whom disclosure of these facts should have been given but was not given? Not at that time. When was the first time that you learned that the post office um, had been given that information? Um, it was quite late on. Um, so essentially, I've summarised the Clark advice, the first Simon Clark advice there. Yeah, I, I'm just, I think it's, it was... It was Probably at the time of the um, the appeal court hearings for the overturned convictions, I think that's when it really started coming to so light. So 2021? Yeah. Was anything ever um, discussed or even hinted at in all of the meetings that you held, all of the conversations that you were a party to, all of the letters that you wrote all of the email exchanges that you had with everyone at the post office from Alice Perkins mm. and Paula Venels down about such problems with convictions? No. Were there convicted sub-postmasters within the JFSA at this time? Yes. I've read somewhere that it was about a third of them um, that must um, vary over the course of time. It did. I think. What was, was the proportion? Yeah, but by the time we got to the GLO of the 550 as such in there, I think about 60 of them. It's about 10 percent, roughly, of convictions. In fact, that had, that had been the the issue that had caused problems with the original um, uh, lawyers that were supporting the Shoesmiths back in 2000 and. Ten. Uh, it's because they couldn't obtain um, uh, ATE insurance um, because we had convictions in the group. And just winding forwards a little bit before um, uh, the break, that cohort of people, I've said it was about a third at this yeah. time, it, it um, changed in number by the time you got up to 550 yeah. 
um, at the time of the, the GLO. What approach did the post office um, take in relation to that group of people, the sub, uh, convicted sub-postmasters, in terms of whether they could um, take their claims to the mediation scheme or have their claims adjudicated within well, a mediation? Uh, in th they actually agreed that they could go forward into the mediation scheme. And were um, such claims adjudicated upon in the mediation? Um, I, I don't recall specifically on that basis. I mean, that, that, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, one of the consequences, um, indeed, one of the only substantial consequences of the interim report was the setting up of the initial complaint and review and mediation scheme, okay. sometimes called the um, ICRMS or sometimes the mediation scheme. Uh, can we look, please, at page 45 of your witness statement, please? Paragraph 133 at the bottom. You say the purpose of the mediation scheme was to address sub-postmaster complaints and individual cases so that there could be an exploration into way they, the way they had been treated with a view to finding a solution for the sub-postmasters, which was likely to involve compensation. It was also set up to establish what had been the truth behind the circumstances. Um, is that a... A complete summary, essentially, of your... It's, it's a fair comment. It's a fair... Yeah, it is, yeah. And if we go over the page, please. Uh, you say in 134 um, that at the outset we thought that the mediation scheme might well achieve the aims it had set out, provided that the post office would enter it in good faith. Uh, we entered into this process as we didn't have any viable alternative at this time. And then um, paragraph 137 over the page, please. Uh, you say, unfortunately, the financing of the scheme came from the post office. It provided the secretariat and uh, administrative support, which suppo were supposed to be independent. However, we were not aware at the time that Belinda Crow was also a member of the post office's covert project Sparrow team, as was the post office's general counsel, as indicated from um, some minutes um, that you refer to. Uh, at this time, at the setting up of the mediation scheme, did you know of the existence of Project Sparrow? No. Thank you. That's a convenient uh, moment, sir. I wonder whether we could um, break until uh, five, five past, please. Very well.
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bates. Can we um, continue with the uh, mediation scheme? And um, look, please, at page 50 of your witness statement of paragraph 146. Uh, I'll just wait for that to come up. It says you, um, it was never agreed that the working group uh, would discuss individual cases. Just stopping there. Can you briefly explain what the working group was in the context of the mediation scheme? Um, the the, the mediation, sorry, the, the working group was uh, a, a combination of the JFSA and post office. And we had an independent chair, um, <coughs> Sir Anthony Hooper. And um, then Second Sight were employed to work for the working group to do the investigations and report back to the, to the group accordingly and produce the reports as uh, required. Thank you. You say it was never agreed that the working group um, would discuss individual cases and make decisions on whether to mediate. It was down to second sight uh, to decide this. Then there was the mediation scheme, which would undertake the process of mediating between post office and the sub-postmasters. Mm -hmm. uh, however, two example cases were discussed prior to second sight starting to produce reports, but only to agree a format in which case reports were to be produced. Um, I just want to explore this issue um, briefly of um, who would make decisions on whether to mediate and whether that was um, down to second sight. Um, you, um, I think, wrote an email about this to Sir Anthony Hooper. Uh, can we see poll 0010751? In fact, it's a letter rather than an email. You can see this is dated the 10th of November, uh, 2014, yeah. to um, Sir Anthony. And you say in the second paragraph, um, JSFA is now of the opinion the scheme has strayed so far from the original purpose for which it was intended that the few applicants who've actually reached a mediation meeting through CEDA, uh, just explain what CEDA was. It was, um, I can't remember what it actually stands for now. It was a... Um, it's a professional dispute, centre for it, dispute yeah, resolution. Dispute, dispute, yeah. <clears throat> uh, have expressed such disappointment within the scheme that um, at least one applicant has withdrawn. And then under number paragraph one, you ask that it's noted, uh, quote, as has been stated on many occasions, it's JFSA's uh, view that it's not the role of the working group to approve which cases go to mediation for the following reasons, which are contained um, within the main document uh, that each of the applicants to the scheme received. Within it, they were promised, and then you set out um, some extracts from it. Yes. Uh, was that your view, that it wasn't the role of the working group to decide or approve which cases should go to mediation? Only in specific instances, for example, if not enough information had been supplied by an applicant as whether his case, you know, to um, fully understand or investigate his case, would it go forward then? Or other, um, other perhaps, you know, I don't know, variations on that theme, but, but the norm, the, the main bulk of them you should go through um, on their own, on their own dependent on the second side's recommendation. And on, um, whilst we're on it, on page four of the letter, please. Um, in the top paragraph there, second line, you say, the further the scheme progresses, the more entrenched and defensive post office has become. And the original concept of actually seeking the truth has long since been abandoned, replaced by denial and a culture of blaming the applicant time after time. The underlying fact that it was the failure of post office to correct the shortcomings of their horizon system and its associated issues is ignored by post office again and again. That's plainly how you felt at the time. Um, what um, material or evidence was that view based upon? Oh, one of the key ones, and I suppose a favourite one of, of the hearing, is, is um, the failure of disclosure. 
it was holding up cases time and time again. And it was also uh, the amount of time post office, um, sorry, the way the scheme worked basically was someone applied to go into the scheme. If it was shown, post office quickly looked at their application to ensure that they were a sub postmaster and they had been there during the period, they say. At that point, they'd been accepted into the mediation scheme. Then um, they would have the option of having an independent um, expert work on their case, either a, a forensic accountant or, or solicitor, at a set fee. They would produce a report at this, uh, about their case, this, in, this person's case. At the same time, post office would be providing their own report on that um, person's case. Both of, these ca the, both of these reports would then go to second side who would investigate them, put together, and make a recommendation to the uh, working group um, on, the, on its findings. Simple as that. Um, but once these cases were being investigated, in theory, by, by post office, they were asking for more and more time. There was meant to be a turnaround period of about four to six weeks um, for them to, to undertake an investigation. But they were, they were asking for extension after extension um, to investigate each of these cases. And in some cases, they were going on for six months or seven months asking for extensions whilst they were investigating. So it just dragged on and on and on and on. And that was one of the big frustrations with all of them. We had, we had very little control of, uh, of the flow at that point. Thank you. Just on the issue of um, who made a recommendation and who made a decision on whether a case was suitable for mediation, can we just go back and look at the one of the founding documents of the scheme? Yeah. At poll 3022120. This is um, an overview um, uh, of the complaint um, review and mediation um, scheme and is one of the um, originating documents published by post office at the time of the initiation of the um, scheme. If we um, look please at page two and three paragraphs from the bottom it says a result as a result of this investigation um, at second sight will produce a case review summarising its findings and a recommendation on whether the case is suitable for mediation. A copy of the case review will be provided to you. The working group will, however, take the final decision on any cases that may not be suitable for mediation. Um, what would you say to the suggestion that this makes it clear that it was the working group that took final decisions on which cases should and should not proceed to mediation? No, I think what, what you're missing here is a, a document which is, uh, is it Q&As or something of that that went with it as well, uh, key points. And there's one of the questions and it asks, uh, will my case go to mediation? And I think the answer to that is it says in the majority of cases it, they will go to mediation. I think where, the, where it takes the final decision on any cases, that, that's those controversial cases where there wasn't enough information uh, at all that had been supplied as part of the application. I think maybe you're referring to um, page five of the document. Are they the FAQs that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's right, the FAQs, yeah. And is the one that you're thinking about on page eight? Will my case definitely be referred to mediation? Is that the one? That's the one, yeah. It's the second paragraph down I was trying. But that second sentence of the paragraph, yeah. second paragraph, yeah. gives us an example, um, the ability of the working group to decide that the case is not one which requires resolution. Yes, there was insert. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't that didn't that give the working group the ultimate power of veto? 
in those circumstances, in those circumstances, if there's insufficient information about a case, we may decide then that it, it wasn't worth it going to mediation. Oh, that's it. Um, but as it says, in, in most cases, if you provide detailed and accurate information, it's likely in most instances. And, and that was where we were relying on second sight to... Uh, I think um, in the course of the uh, work of the mediation, you um, wrote a number of letters to the then minister, Joe Swinson, mm. about its operation. Is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, can we look at some of those, please? Um, poll 0014 4511. You'll see that it's dated the 17th of April. I'm not going to read um, the first page. If we can skip to the second page, please. And look at the last paragraph on page two and onto page three. There's no doubt at all that the systemic failures identified so far have been brought to post offices' attention through their regular meetings with Second Side. And this alone raises the question as to why post office is continuing with their prosecutions of sub postmasters when it is now so much more obvious that they are standing on very shaky legal ground. As I've mentioned before, these systemic failures are proven facts which are at the root of many of the sub-postmaster cases, although from the second site briefing document presented at the Port Cullis House meeting, they're only going to be treated as um, an adjunct to the issue of individual cases, to the point where only a few of them may be featured in their forthcoming report. It's evident to us that these systemic failures should become the yardstick that the individual cases are measured against, as they're significantly easier for others to comprehend without the requirement of an in-depth knowledge of the finer points of horizon. The refocusing of the investigation on the systemic failures would not only offer a quicker and far more efficient method of addressing the whole issue, but would minimise the uh, information required from post office, which has been the main cause of the slow and um, at times no progress second sight has made with the individual um, cases. Um, did you get any um, reassurance back from the minister? I don't recall. Um, no, I, can we I move? Think, yeah, sorry. Can we move on then, please, to poll 0014 5664. And look at page three, please. A foot of the page. We're now on the 18th of July. This is another communication from you um, to the minister. You refer to a reply of the 11th of July where you confirm that further cases can be put forward to review. Um, you say that you recently wrote to MPs who raised questions uh, about um, 47 cases that only ever seem to be um, commented on. And you um, refer in the report, sorry, you, you say the 47 cases referred to in the report comprises of, and then you give a breakdown. And then if we scroll up the page, please. A bit further, please. Do you see that your email um, to the minister's correspondence address has found its way to um, the SHEX, the shareholder executive within the Department for Business Innovation and Skills? Mm. But this is as the email has been produced to us. We can't see yeah. um, how it got there. Um, address to um, Martin Edwards and um, Susan Crichton and two other members of the, or two members of the SHEX. And then if we just take that off, please. Uh, Mr. Whitehead within Biz. Um, says Martin, Susan, the email letter below from Alan Bates at JFSA to Joe Swinson raises a number of issues which would be helpful for us to discuss with you before drafting a reply. I think a meeting within the next week or so might be the best way forwards, given the range and complexity of some of the issues involved. Uh, did you know or did you appreciate 
at the time that um, notwithstanding what had been said by uh, government ministers about um, operating an arm's length relationship with the post office, um, there was nonetheless a back channel of communications between the government and the post office. No, no I, I can't say I was aware of that. No. With your correspondence being copied from um, uh, the government to the post office? I could understand them perhaps having some concern because I was in regular contact with many of the MPs there. Um, but uh, no, I can't um, say I was aware of it. And if we um, just go to page one, please. We can see on this page um, uh, emails within the post office, starting in the middle of the page, from Alwyn Lyons to Mark Davis, um, Martin Edwards and Susan Crichton. And she says, when discussing what reply to give, is um, the problem is that the problem we have is that he, that's you, doesn't know we um, have seen the letter. We need to be careful that the minister is not um, seen to be aligning with us by us, help, uh, by us asking us to help her respond. I'll read that again. The problem we have is that he, that's you, doesn't know we've seen the letter, that's your letter, and we need to be careful that the minister is not seen to be aligning with us, that's the post office, by asking us to help her respond. So they're discussing essentially how to play it with you without revealing that the government has sent on your letter to the post office, correct? Seems to be that way, yeah. You say in your witness statement that there were no changes as a result of your letter, um, uh, the, the one that we've just looked at. Did um, Joe Swinson, um, in fact, respond to you? I don't recall. I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember. No, I don't recall. Can we turn on to another letter you wrote to Joe Swinson a year later, on the 16th of April 2014, when she was still Minister for Postal Affairs? Um, poll 302, 2683. Uh, we can see the date and to whom it's addressed. And for some context, um, by that date, uh, was it right that no post office investigation had been completed to a sufficient state for Second Sight to complete its own reports? Yeah. Uh, you set out um, how the scheme was meant to work, if we just scroll down. And keep scrolling. And keep scrolling. Keep scrolling. You say that the above structure was agreed and published at scheme launch, and the documentation is uh, still available for downloading at. Essentially, that's the documentation that I showed you um, earlier. Yes. Unfortunately, the reality of where the scheme is actually at is very different. Um, as at the date of writing, so this is April, mid-April 2014, during uh, the time the scheme was open for applications, 150 cases were accepted, although it should be noticed that since the scheme was closed, there have been others who would have applied if they'd been aware of its existence. Of the 150, the earliest that Poll became aware of the names of individuals and the identities of the post offices that were to be involved was as follows. Uh, next bullet point, once the criteria to enter the scheme had been met and the working group had approved the initial application, the personalised CQR, can you um, explain what the CQR was? It was the initial um, report. Um, that was sent out to the relevant applicant for completion um, with the um, um, assistance of their PA. So far, the returned completed CQRs are as follows, and you set them out over the page. And then you say, top of the next page, yet to date, Poll has not finalised a single case report to the point where it's ready for the working group to consider its suitability for being sent to mediation. And realistically, that could still be a considerable um, time off. If we scroll down further and keep going. 
and keep going. Uh, stop there. That third paragraph, you say, regardless of what it says publicly, poll in practice seems not only to be hardening its corporate defence, but now seems to be prepared to invoke the protection of pu the public purse as their last line of justification for not righting the wrongs they've inflicted on so many. It appears uh, whatever poll can block, it does. For some reason, the post office is the only one that doesn't seem to be able to recognise what everybody else can uh, see so clearly. And then you talk about um, the only way we're going to resolve this is through the media and the courts. And so what was your principal concern by the time you were writing this letter? I think, um, I think this is a time when um, the uh, post office had changed their general counsel. I think this was at the point where Chris Ojard had come along. Do correct me if I'm wrong. Getting the, uh, I think that was September 2013 from memory. Yeah, and it's coming along there. And I think when he turned up, I think he had a very clear remit to get rid of the mediation scheme or to change it or to bin it or whatever because he was also part of this Project Sparrow, which was, as we later to find, um, uh, monitoring what was going on in that scheme and how it was going ahead. Now... I had a, a big discussion with, with um, Chris O'Shard over the um, interpretation of the aims and the objectives of the scheme, and that was earlier on in the, the year, that year. And um, I remember I had to detail him uh, to him the whole scheme, how it was meant to work, and I also copied in Sir Anthony Hooper on that correspondence as well. But basically, it seemed they were trying to twist it, twist it, twist it the whole time to take away its effectiveness. And um, it, I mean, it, it, just, it just wasn't, it didn't feel wholesome anymore. <laughs> it didn't feel like we were after the truth anymore. It just felt like we were trying to defend post office's position in all of this. You tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph 145, no need to turn it up, that as a result of writing this letter, there, uh, this letter, there was no change um, as a result. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I think, in fact, you got a letter back from Paul, Paula Venels, which criticised you for writing in for these writing, terms yeah. to Joe Swinson. Yeah, that's correct. Let's have a quick look at that, please. Poll 0011-6501. I think this is a draft, but I think it's in the terms that it was sent. No doubt we can chase that down if I'm wrong. Um, your letter of the 16th of April um, to the uh, minister has been passed to me for reply. Since the publication of the second site interim report, post offices work collaboratively with the JFSA as a, an organization. Is that true? To a very small degree. Uh, and you, as its chair, to design the initial complaint and review and mediation scheme. The scheme documentation was agreed with you and put on your website. That is correct, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the post office has remained true to the aims of the scheme. Is that correct? <laughs> to a degree. Uh, committed substantial um, resource to ensure its success and respected the confidentiality of the working group. Um, and then there's about sharing a platform on the 24th of March. Against that background, your action in sending your letter, that's the letter to the minister, has come as a shock and a disappointment um, to her. I find two things troubling. The content of your letter would appear to breach the confidentiality of the working group, and furthermore paints a picture which is inconsistent with the position as I understood it to be. Well, that's an, another one of these things where, you know, is she getting the right information from her staff? She never attended these meetings. Never, ever attended one of the working group meetings, to the best of my knowledge. And, of course, this is to be set against the context of the email discussion oh, yeah, yeah. that I took you to, which is how do we inform the minister's reply to this letter without disclosing... That that we've informed the minister's reply to this letter mm. without disclosing that fact. 
Um, the second point she makes is the fact you've bypassed the structure of the working group to raise your concerns. Post Office has displayed a strong commitment to the scheme over a prolonged period of time. I remain committed in principle to making the scheme work, but your letter has damaged the trust Post Office has invested in you as a member of the working group. There are a number of specific points in your letter the Post Office will need to address. I've asked Chris OER to prepare a more detailed response. In the meantime, I'll need to consider Post Office's position in relation to the um, scheme over the coming days. Did you know that the Post Office was having an internal debate at this time over whether your letter presented a golden opportunity because of your alleged breach of confidentiality for the post office to back out of the scheme and bring it to a quick close? No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I presume this was something that was discussed in Project Sparrow. I, I don't know, maybe a question for them. But I mean, my concern has always been the, the, the group first, what's best for the group, and not what's best for post office in all of this. So I, mean, I was representing the group in these discussions and with what was going on, and I had to stand up for what, what was right at the time for them. Can we turn to um, paragraph 157 of your witness statement, please? Which is on page uh, 53. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. You say um, in paragraph 157 that you believe the mediation scheme failed as it was part of the cover-up by poll. I expect the post office discovered things that they did not like and did not want to come out. It was definitely an element of not wanting to accept fault. I believe the post office had no intention whatsoever of getting to a mutually acceptable and fair decision. If anything, it seemed as if the post office had been using the scheme as a fishing expedition to see what evidence sub-postmasters actually had about Horizon. Was what you say there based on information from sub-postmasters? No, I, I, it was, I suppose, it's the, it's the feedback from working on the scheme for the, that many months or that, those years um, and knowing the way post office operated. Uh, I mean, I've been dealing with them then for many, many years and I certainly could see the way they operated and what they're up to and whether they're forthcoming on issues. In what circumstances um, did the uh, post office terminate the scheme? <laughs> I got a phone call. I got a phone call and um, just to say, oh, we've decided to send all the cases to mediation now, so there's no need for the working group to meet. Now, interestingly, interestingly that was the day before a meeting was due to be held in which we were going to see the draft of the second site part two report, which was damning. And I think one of the reasons they did that to stop, stop that report from coming out. And what was your view of the decision of the post office to um, terminate the scheme? Um, I suppose publicly I was very dismayed about it. I think privately I was ecstatic about it because I'd been thinking of pulling out of that scheme for about 12 months, and I'd been sitting in there the whole of that period to get as much information and reports out of them in order for us to move on to the next step of legal action. Uh, did you um, then make a decision that it was necessary to commence legal proceedings? We had been looking around for a little while. It was, I think the writing was on the wall, or had been for a number of months, and we'd spoken to... Uh, a few firms, a few firms, uh, initial the discussion. The first claim turning to the group litigation was um, issued in April 2016. The first claim? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, we eventually found Freeths in yes. September of 2015. Yes. That's when they came on board, and then they really took over. And one of the first steps was an application by... Um, the claimants for a group litigation order. That's correct. And that was opposed by the post office, is that right? That's correct. Um, despite that opposition, the, po the court ordered that the claim should be managed under a group litigation order from the 22nd of March 2017. That's, That's right. right. I think um, 
the JFSA made an announcement by press release of the making of the group litigation order, didn't it? Uh, I don't recall it. I probably did. Well, do you remember there was a time if people wanted to join in the group litigation, a date by which they had to do so, a cut-off date? Uh, y yes, there was. I mean, the, the, with Freeth, and Freeth took quite an active role in this, we, we had to find the funding, and then we had to go out and recruit far more um, claimants in there. And so then they, uh, a whole batch of PA and uh, advertising was undertaken for a few months in there to bring forward the numbers that were needed to, uh, I think the, um, I don't know what they call them, the schedules are the names that go forward to be attached to the GLO. I think there were about three that were attached to eventually finish up with the 550 that went forward. To the Can we um, uh, briefly look at the release that you made, the press release that um, the JFSA made, poll 00248057. and go to um, page two, towards the bottom, please. Um, this is an email um, from um, Melanie um, Caulfield, a name that we'll become um, familiar with in these phases. And she's a member of the post office's communications team. And just going back to the email, you'll see um, she um, emails Roderick Williams, Andrew Parsons of Bond Dickinson and others saying we've been alerted by a trade mag to a statement issued by the JFSA. And then if we go down the page a little bit, uh, there is the JFSA statement cut into her email. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, you say That's right. in the statement, JFSA announced today that the um, group litigation order against the post office has now been approved by the president of the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court, which means that the case will continue through the court as a group action. Post Office Limited is defending the claim. Over a thousand sub postmasters from across the UK have now applied, uh, applied to um, join the action. I think about 1,200 eventually applied, but I think by the time they'd sifted through them, we finished up with 550. Yeah. And um, at the second paragraph on the uh, second page there, you can see a quote from you. Mm. Alan Bates of GFSA said the ca case is now up and running. We've um, had over 1,000 plus candidates come forward so far. Uh, sub postmasters have until 26th of July to join the action before the cutoff which prevents new claimants at joining the claim thereafter. And I just want to ask you some questions about the, the rest of this email chain, even though you weren't copied into it, because they're relevant to later witnesses. If we just scroll up the page, please. You'll see that Mel Caulfield sends it to, amongst others, Andrew Parsons. And then in the email, there's a reply from the head of uh, portfolio Legal Risk and Governance, Mark Underwood, saying JFSA have issued a statement that's been picked up by Nick Wallace and Computer Weekly. The statement is included in Mel's note below. Um, I don't think there's anything new included in it, save for the claim that over 1,000 sub-postmasters from across the Q UK have now applied to join the action. Though concerning, they've chosen to use the word applied rather than just joined or similar. And then further up, Um, Jane McLeod, uh, who we're to hear from, the Group Director of Legal Risk and Governance, says, I think the key words are underlined below. They haven't joined yet, exclamation mark. And then further up the page, Andrew Parsons says that he's happy with the comms. That's a draft reply. Plus, let's not forget that Alan Bates has a somewhat re loose relationship with the truth. <laughs> Um, just two questions on that, um, if I may. Firstly, um, was what you were saying in the press release accurate? Yes. Secondly, had you ever had any dealings with Mr. Parsons? Oh, yes. Um, had, you, had you had any dealings with Mr. Parsons that might properly allow him to form the view that you had a somewhat loose relationship with the truth? No. I mean, um, 
uh, Andy Parsons was one of those who used to appear at the, the uh, working group meetings, one of the many lawyers that post office used to send to them. And um, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't know why he's come up with that. I mean, I. I, sometimes, I might embellish, but I don't like I mean, anything to promote it. I suppose I spend too much time around lawyers from now and then, so the wording and phrasing of it sometimes can seem a little bit that way. But it was quite right. We'd had over 1,200 people that did apply to, to join the scheme. And um, out of that, as I say, 550 were signed up to it. Um, I think in the um, course of the litigation, that can come down, thank you, um, there was an application to strike out um, passages from your witness statement, is that right? You know, the long 41-page witness statement we I think looked so. at earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the post office applied to um, uh, strike it out. Um, and that application was dismissed. For The reference is poll 404094. Um, in the course of that um, judgment, is it right that the judge and in a previous judgment delivered warnings about aggressive litigation tactics? Yes. From your perspective as a litigant, uh, what if any litigation tactics were being used uh, by the post office? Oh, uh, uh, they're definitely trying to outspend us. Uh, I mean, we, we, we'd have to raise commercial funding from it. They had a, a bottomless pocket as such. Uh, being a government organisation. So anything they could do to spin it out or any, anything they could do to recuse the judge or, or whatever, they did. And um, anything to cost us money and uh, try and get us to um, stop the case. That was obvious. Um, you gave evidence in the Common Issues trial. I did. Um, the reference is poll... Triple zero two at uh, two nine three six, um, and for reference between uh, pages forty four and fifty one, the judge um, deals with um, your evidence and the findings that he made about your truthfulness and um, honesty, which I'm not going to um, display at the moment. In your witness statement, you provide examples of what you say was the post office trying to prevent the truth coming out in the group litigation. Okay. Uh, can you assist us with what those um, um, tactics were? Well, uh, obviously to outspend us. That, that was the key one uh, throughout all of that. And um, I think I've just sort of listed the main points that they've gone through. Uh, I think it's right that um, you have yourself made an application for redress. Yes, I have. And when was the application made? Gosh, um, it was, must have been, I think it was October last year. And um, I'm not going to ask you what um, any of the figures are or the offers are. Um, when did you first receive an offer? Um, I received an offer, I think it was 77 working days after my um, claim had gone in, um, <clears throat> which against the target of the department responding in 40 days. I mean, and the offer that they actually made was only about a sixth of the claim that had gone in there. And um, it's, I mean, you know, I'm trying to fight for everyone's uh, financial redress in this, but I've also got to fight for my own as well. And I have no doubt that, um, it, there's a bit of vindictiveness coming in from the department and post office on this. And the reason I say that is, is quite simple. They don't think there's any worth to any of the work that I've done over the years. I mean, my, my claim has gone in and it's been treated exactly the same as everyone else's. They all have these heads of claims in there. There are some heads of claim that apply to some people and not to others. So I was never made a bankrupt, so that doesn't apply to me. Um, I was never suspended and so on and so forth. So they, they do vary. But, and this was without me knowing, the lawyers representing or dealing with my claim and also the forensic accountants dealing with my claim 
put it together, and I was not involved with the figures, and they put it together and they included an amount for the work that I'd done over the 20 years. It's like another column heading. And that's been totally negated by them. In other words, government doesn't think anything I've done is worth anything. I think the first offer you received was um, shortly before your appearance before the Select Committee in January. Yeah. And you um, said publicly that it was derisory. It was. Still is. Have you received any um, further offers since then? No. Nope. Um, a challenge letter went in um, from my lawyer, but, and they were meant to hear last week a response which they never did receive, and so I still don't know anything. From your perspective, has the process of seeking and obtaining redress been efficient and effective? No. In your case, what have been the principal problems aside from the timeliness of the reply with the operation of the scheme of redress? Um, the initial problem was disclosure by post office. I mean, once again, they just would not come forward with it. And considering they knew the names of all of those people involved in that scheme, when, from the date when the minister um, announced the scheme, which was, I think, March 22. Um, so there's no reason they, they couldn't have started at that You mean point. they had a head start? A head start on it, yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was quite fortuitous, um, the comment made by Sir Wynne uh, first thing this morning about disclosure and that you should just carry on with regardless and just ignore it. If it hasn't come through, just get on with the job. And I think that's really what should have happened quite a while ago. Um, standing back, uh, what's your experience of the culture of the post office in your dealings with it over the years? Uh, they're an atrocious organisation. They need disbanding, it needs removing, it needs building up again from the ground floor, and as I've been quoted <laughs> quite commonly, the whole of the, the whole of the postal service nowadays, it's it's beyond it's a dead duck. It's beyond saving, and to be quite fair, it needs to be sold to someone like Horizon. Uh, sorry, I, I said like Horizon. <laughs> Last thing I'd say. <laughs> sold to someone like Amazon. Um, it, it needs a, a real big injection of money, and I, only, I think that can only happen coming in from outside. Otherwise, it's just going to be, it's going to be a bugbear for the government for the years to come. And Mr. Bates, thank you very much for answering um, my many questions um, today. So there's only one set of questions from sub-postmaster groups, and they're from Mr. Henry, and I think we'll take under 10 minutes. Well, I'm just going to move over here so that I can see Mr. Henry, unimpeded by a large pillar. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Um, you've exposed over many years the post office's suppression of disclosure and covering up the truth over Horizon's flaws. But you have also exposed, have you not, the government's reckless indifference to the post office's misconduct over many years. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think that is the case. And I, I mean, since all this, well, since this year, I suppose, since the drama, and we've, got, we've had far more publicity uh, about the issue nationally. I, I mean, I've noticed there's a general frustration with many other organizations um, that have that problem with government as well. It seems to be a fundamental flaw in the way government works, that they can't deal with these types of things easily and sensibly. Could I take you to a letter you received? And we'll deal with it very briefly, but it's POL 001-02385. And this is a letter you received shortly after the 19th of March 2015 from the Minister Joe Swinson. And you had written to her 
on the 10th of March regarding the post office mediation scheme. And have you had a chance to look at this letter before coming here today? Um, possibly. Um, Would you care to read it to yourself? And when you have done so, could you let me know? Because I want to take you to just one passage in it. But I want to give you the opportunity to refresh your memory in case there is anything you would like to point out. Yeah. Thank you. You can see at the conclusion that the Minister states, to conclude, I note that though Second Sight's report and the subsequent investigations, through Second Sight's report and the subsequent investigations, forgive me, there is no evidence of a system-wide problems with Horizon. This conclusion has stood firm through nearly two years of investigation. Mm -hmm. Were you... Um, Forgive me, when did you become aware that the post office had in fact written to their insurers nearly two years before that to notify them of issues with Horizon, potential issues with Horizon, which was originally going to be described as financial discrepancies that have occurred in Horizon? When did you become aware that the post office had written to their insurers? Well, uh, um, there are two parts to that answer. The, the first one, I think, is um, when a lot of people became aware of it, which was during the... Um, uh, it was the overturning of convictions over those cases, the appeal courts. Uh, I think that's when it... one of the times it arose. But also... I mean, the, there's a similar reference that I've seen recently in a document disclosed to me um, for, for the hearing. And there was, I'm trying to think of the date, it was July... Was it 2013? It might be 2013 or 2013. Uh, was, was this the one, uh, this is about the, what do they call it, the officers and uh, DNO insurance. Shall I take you to it? Yes, that would help. So if we could go to POL yeah. 001 45716, please. And I'm going to ask you to look at uh, some correspondence um, between Charles Cahoon, and this is at page internal numbering four of six, Charles Cahoon... Susan Crichton, and Andrew Parsons, whom, of course, you know. So if we go to page four of six, uh, Charles Cahoon, Wednesday, July the 24th, 2013, been discussing this with Miller, what, would she, we, what we should tell JLT re-horizon issues. We've worked up the attached version, which hasn't been sent, any comments. Up a little bit. Andy, could you take a look at this draft letter to go to our insurance broker, read the horizon issue? I've not looked at it, thanks, Susan. So that's Susan Crichton. Then we have Mr. Parsons, July the 24th, 2013, at 6.51 in the evening. Susan, the letter does nothing more than put Paul's insurers on notice of the horizon issues. It's very bland. My only hesitation is whether this is strictly necessary to do. From a PR perspective, it would look bad if this got into the public domain. Sign of guilt, oblique, concern from the board. Uh, I'd be happy to have one of our insurance lawyers look, at it, uh, look over the DNO policy, directors and officers policy, to see if Paul is required to notify the insurers. If not, then we might want to hold fire on this. I would recommend tweaking the first paragraph. The current version suggests that there are problems with Horizon, when at present there are no systemic problems to report. Uh, it should just say that the press have reported a potential, on potential issues with Horizon, 
rather than financial discrepancies have occurred in Horizon. Um, and then, if we could then go please to page one of the internal numbering. And we can see again, this time on the 29th of July, a further email from Mr. Parsons and a bullet point summary at the top, six bullet points. Would you be kind enough, Mr. Bates, to read those six bullet points to yourself? Yes. And do you see anything in there which you consider to be symptomatic of the post office's habitual problem with disclosure? Yeah, um, certainly a one, two, three, four. The, the fifth bullet point. Oh, no, the fourth and the fifth. Um, the risk of notification is that it would look bad for Poll if it ever became public knowledge that Poll had it notified its insurers. To reduce this risk, it is recommended that rather than sending a formal written notification, Poll speaks to Charteris, renamed AIG, and verbally notifies them so as not to leave a paper trail. In our experience, AIG may be prepared to accept a verbal notification. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So... Uh, with a view, I suppose, thereafter to plausible deniability over the issue since there isn't anything written down. No paper trail. No paper trail. Could I now, Mr Bates, and this is my final topic, ask you a few questions about the litigation that bears your name? And I realise that Mr Beer has already asked you some, but I want you to consider whether the no-holds-barred approach adopted by the post office may not have been motivated not simply to win at all costs to defeat you and your fellow claimants, but to kill the prospects of any future criminal appeals that rested on the outcome of your litigation. Now, have you formed a view, bearing in mind all that has passed, have you formed a view that the conduct of the way in which they uh, approached the Horizon Common Issues and the Horizon Issues judgment may in part have been influenced by the fact that rather than just being concerned about losing a money claim, they were also concerned that if they lost that money claim that you had brought against them, they would then be exposed to potential criminal appeals concerning people who had been wrongly prosecuted, some of whom, of course, who had been wrongly imprisoned. Have you formed any view about that? I'm quite certain that they were very concerned on a whole number of fr fronts, and certainly that would have been one of them. And the other one would have been protecting the brand at any cost. I think that was a key one and protecting the roles of those involved with making the decisions over the years that they took so wrongly. I think there's a whole batch of reasons that they went ahead with it. And I heard a, I heard a comment that was meant to have come from the board at that time, that it should be buried at any cost, this court case. And I think we, we saw that, or saw them trying to do that along the way. So I have no doubt that they were desperate to get rid of it on for a whole raft of reasons. And that would include those criminal oh, appeals absolutely. which Absol rested on the outcome. Absolutely. And that they'd known they were wrong for many, many years. Thank you, Mr Bates. I, I suppose, um, following Mr Henry's point, and I think I've got this right, the claims in the GLO on behalf of some of the claimants included claims for malicious prosecution. So inevitably, the propriety of the prosecutions were in issue, in effect, in the civil proceedings. Yeah. 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 
Thank you, Mr. Bates. Mr. Beer, anything else? No, there's nothing arising. That's the end of Mr. Bates's evidence. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your witness statement, and thank you for providing answers on a very, um, to a great many number of questions. And I can see hands preparing, and I know what's coming because it's inevitable. And I fully <laughs> understand why they want to applaud you, Mr. Bates. But I'm going to ask you not to, for this reason, that there will be witnesses who are coming in the next um, so forth who may not be as attractive to many of you. And I would hate to think that I would have to intervene when they're here to prevent bad behavior. So in the interest of people being even-handed, I'm asking you to remember that this is not a public meeting but a public inquiry. It's not a court of law, but it's a judicial process. So please leave it there. Tomorrow morning, we will resume at 10 o'clock. As you know, I appeared on the first day of phase four and then disappeared completely in the sense that I conducted the hearings remotely. I fear my circumstances are such that that will still be necessary i.e. that I will conduct most of the hearings remotely during this passage. I do intend to appear as often as I can, but I want you to be frank with you, it won't be very often. I find that I can do this acceptably, but I want to be open with you about, happen about what's happening henceforth, all right? So we will resume tomorrow, but I'll be on a screen, not sitting here. Thank you, sir.